the sound of sandwiches being unwrapped. That's how we know it's time to get started with our lunchtime panel. So welcome everyone. Please, you know, continue to, to eat and grab your food um, and, and join us. I'm Kelly Sexton, Associate Vice President for Research, Technology Transfer, and Innovation Partnerships at the University of Michigan. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our 19th annual Celebrate Invention. Um, today is a wonderful day for us to recognize the many achievements of University of Michigan inventors. Um, their quest for knowledge and to push the boundaries of technology and their drive for impact and to see their discoveries have a life and have impact beyond uh, the boundaries of our campus. Um, their drive uh, for impact led to a really record year at the University of Michigan for technology transfer last year. We had over 500 uh, new invention disclosures submitted by our faculty. Um, we negotiated over 230 new licenses and options, and we supported the launch of a record-breaking 22 new startup companies. Um, the work and the ongoing work of our startup companies and our licensees is crucial to amplifying the impact of the research that occurs on our campus. Last year alone, our startup companies raised over $643 million in investment to continue advancing University of Michigan discoveries, turning them into new therapeutics, new products that will improve people's quality of lives and benefit the world. We really appreciate you coming out and participating in this event. It is our surrounding ecosystem um, that's so central to our success and our efforts. And I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces around the room. And all I can say is welcome. We're really glad that you're here. The University of Michigan continues to recognize that as the nation's leading public research university, we have an enormous responsibility to ensure that every technology created on our campuses has the opportunity to positively impact the world. We have a responsibility to society to be relentless in our efforts to bring the benefits of publicly funded research to society. So this year, when we were planning Celebrate Invention, um, we asked people, what would you like to hear about? What would you find useful? What would you find inspiring? And a theme began to emerge um, with people wanting to know more about the future of the university's research enterprise. Specifically, people wanted to know more about the future for innovation, discovery, and how we're going to translate those into impact. So we thought, who better um, to speak to that than the individual charged with catalyzing, safeguarding, and supporting research at the University of Michigan. So it's my pleasure to um, welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Rebecca Cunningham, who is our Interim Vice President for Research at the University of Michigan, with responsibilities for fostering the excellence and integrity of research across all three of our campuses. Uh, Rebecca has vast experience as a researcher, administrator, physician, educator, and clinician, including more than 20 years spent in emergency medicine physician at both UM and Hurley Medical Center in Flint, Michigan. Dr. Cunningham has secured over $50 million in federal research funding and has authored or co-authored more than 170 scholarly publications that focus on injury prevention, opioid overdose, substance misuse, prevention, and public health, firearm safety, and she has established a national consortium to improve firearm research safety. She served as Associate Vice President for Research of Health Sciences and is the former research chair for the UM Department of Emergency Medicine. She was recently named the first William G. Barzon Collegiate Professor of Emergency Medicine. And last night, we learned that she was one of just three University of Michigan faculty to be admitted into the National Academy of Medicine. Those of us who work with Those of us who work with Rebecca also always wonder where she stores her cape. Um, and it's my pleasure to invite her up for this discussion. Thank you for being here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. 
absolutely. We were hoping to get two ferns on either side of us, but, but absent that, we'll, we'll just work with the University of Michigan banner. So, um, Rebecca, you've been on the job now since June. Um, I think we'd love to hear some of your early impressions of the, both the Office of Research at the University of Michigan and hear your description of the roles and responsibilities for the Vice President of Research. Sure, this, this does sound like it's on. So, first of all, good, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really just delighted to be here. Um, as Kelly said, uh, I've been in this position now since June, and first of all, I can say I've been having just a fabulous time, uh, being so energized by the amazing work uh, that's going on around the university, much of which I knew a fair amount about, but an awful lot still continues to amaze me, even after being on campus here um, as faculty for about 25 years. I, I still every day and, and wandering into a building and talking to faculty who are doing interesting, fabulous research that I didn't know before. Um, so uh, in our office, I think, has as much confusion as clarity for a lot of people. So uh, as the central office overseeing the largest public research uh, operation in the country, um, we have uh, a, a number of buckets of things that we do that Kelly broke down sort of nicely. Um, we, and I'll break them down for you again. So the broad umbrella there are these three things where we catalyze, support, and safeguard research. And what does that mean? Um, so first of all, we're a very decentralized university. We have 19 schools and colleges, and the research from that happens in those schools and colleges, as well as the money to those schools and colleges that they generate, go back to the schools and colleges who we feel in this decentralized university make the best localized decisions about how to operate the research and grow it at their local level. And that is the primary model um, in our decentralized university. So then what is the role of a central office like ours in catalyzing research? So those 19 schools across campus are each doing amazing things, but we have the opportunity to sit between the chairs of those and really figure out how to help best catalyze the interactions between the two of them. We have several of the number one schools, in, in the, in, sometimes in the world and, and in the nation, uh, on our campus here, uh, and a number of, uh, of the rest of the schools that are absolutely top 10. And so figuring out how their missions can uh, overlap and integrate and synergize is part of what the vision of our office is doing, um, both in the initiatives that we create as well as uh, in the faculty that we're best positioned to understand what they're doing who, who don't yet know each other across campus because we are so large and people do live in their own silos. So that is absolutely, that catalyzing component is absolutely a really important um, part of the work that we do here. Um, there's some other really basic functions that um, are as important, uh, but in some ways um, are, are less jazzy than that catalyzing component. We support all of the research that goes out through the university. So all of that you know, $1.5 billion of research um, expenditures that happens comes through our Office of uh, Contracts and uh, Grants, ORSP. Uh, and those submissions are managed out. We manage the flow then back in, in conjunction with other offices on campus. So in, in that way, we support all of those submissions uh, through working with the schools and colleges that are engaged at the local level and the departments at their local level. Those all roll up to our office eventually um, to go out because none of us as, as researchers, and as Kelly mentioned, I've had my own research portfolio here, uh, pre 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 predominantly NIH, but also CDC, I mean, um, for over 20 years here. And all of that isn't given to me, but given to the regents of the University of Michigan and then administered by us, and that is, that's the way that, that we work at, at universities. Uh, we also do things like manage the tech transfer and economic development of that research, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that today. Um, and then we safeguard research. Um, there's a lot to be done to make sure that the research we're doing is done ethically, is done in compliance with the multitude of increasing rules that um, are both necessary and important, but also confusing to faculty, especially who are just engaging. Everything from all of the human research uh, oversight on campus to make sure that we're respectful of human subjects research, to uh, animal use and compliance across campus, all of that rolls up to our office. Um, and is centrally overseen to make sure that we stay accredited and we stay on the right side of the line um, for doing uh, the best kind of work we can do and taking some of that burden off of our investigators for the management and understanding the complex rules that come down uh, federally on that so that they can do the good work that they do around um, developing great new ideas. 
Thank you. So, Rebecca, are you saying that you don't get $1.55 billion every year and, and get to pick and choose Sad. where that money goes? Sad, just to be true. clear. Um, I, um, that does not reflect the requests I get, just to be clear. <laughs> Uh, so common misperception, yes, the funds flow in our university, the indirect model flows back to the units where those uh, dollars were derived, and back to the schools and colleges, overwhelmingly. That's the way the model works. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, having been in the position since June, what are you seeing as some of the, you know, biggest opportunities um, where the Office of Research can catalyze uh, research across campus? Yeah, so I think that um, our office sitting between the chairs as it does, has, does have that view that you don't get in any of the individual units. And so for that, we have the opportunity to be um, a central distributor of information, of uh, flow of knowledge between the units, of understanding and analyzing some of the research metrics that are going on within units and helping units um, titrate those. Um, and, and then catalyzing some of those initiatives as we were talking about before that where faculty have great ideas in one school and we know that they would do really well to pair with faculty in another school and to help those merge together. So at the university, um, one of our biggest sources of funding for the great research that happens on campus comes from federal funding agencies. Um, what do you see as some of the big high-level trends when it comes to federal funding of research at the University of Michigan and at universities around the country? Sure. So uh, about half, about 55 percent of our annual research expenditures, that big number that we keep throwing around, come from, come from the federal government. Um, and some of those funding sources have been very flat for a while. So the NIH funding budget has been um, relatively flat for many years. And so, for example, uh, for those of you, that, uh, the, a big award in the NIH is a, the classic uh, new uh, award that faculty are striving to get before they get tenure is an R01 award. That R01 award has been the same amount of money, $500,000, for my entire career. <laughs> my staff want to get paid more still over that time uh, uh, than they did before. So that is a relative decrease every year um, over the 20 years that I've been getting NIH funding, you know, of 3% cuts to our budgets to do the work we have to do. Um, so with that, we really we have a need to diversify our portfolios, um, to look for broad uh, partners, um, both private sector and foundation sector and industry partners, um, and to best understand how to fill out that portfolio. And I think that does us well anyway, because it, it, gets, um, it gets faculty thinking about different audiences different audiences for their work and different ways that our research can serve the world in different manners. Um, and we do that by sometimes thinking a little bit more out of the box and having a, having a mixed portfolio. So I think ultimately it's a good idea. In terms of sort of large trends overall, um, you know, some of the numbers that have come up, these are national, I'll remind you again, this is not the university budget. Uh, total R&D expenditures over, uh, according to the recent, recent herd data that was out um, nationally, are upwards of $75 billion, which is 4.7 up um, from uh, 2016 data. So federal funding on the R&D has increased some, both in constant and current do dollars for that time. But some of the individual institution budgets have, have not necessarily um, not necessarily been raised, and obviously some of those federal portfolios have been cut during that time. Yeah. I want to come back to the, the federal funding in a minute, but I, I want to dig in and, and talk a little bit about the industry portfolio. Um, so one of the things that the University of Michigan, I think, was an early leader in was creating a, a center to really focus on connecting the university with companies, and that's the Business Engagement Center, which I think is now 11 years up and running, and it's is recognized as a national model. It reports um, both up to the Office of Research and up to the Office of University Development. And I think that's been a very powerful model. You know, we see that in the, um, I think, 100 plus million dollars in industry-sponsored research awards that the university gains every year. Um, I wonder if, uh, you know, you want to talk a little bit about the work of the Business Engagement Center and how that's received by faculty. Yeah, so I think that the Business Engagement Center for the faculty who are using it are, is very well received, but I think it's like some things in our office that is really um, a secret that we need to keep getting out a little bit more. Um, so it is a great service, like 
as I described a moment ago, our central office of research is really a service office at its core. Um, we are here to serve the needs of research across, uh, across uh, the faculty for their research across the university. You know, by that catalyzing, supporting, and serving, and safeguarding. And one of those ways is to help faculty who we know come up uh, and are grown up with an academic bent and don't necessarily have any good idea on how to engage uh, with industry partners. And so the Business Engagement Office is set up for that purpose, uh, to help hold their hand and guide them through those connections um, and understanding of how the, um, uh, the, the pieces of the way that their industry partner may be thinking about things is not their academic perspective and how we can bridge those together for our common goals and our common good. Because we have a lot of common goals and a lot of common good and a lot of great industry partners uh, that the BBC has helped foster. So. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that that comment about you know the central office and serving the entire campus is so important because you know when the business engagement center can connect you know a company with a faculty member in psychology, you know, and bring that connection to a new faculty member who you know wasn't really seeking to work with industry, but once they see how it can benefit um, you know their research and the value it can add to um, you know their goals. That's really when we're adding value for that faculty member. And so I think, you know, tracking and understanding when we're making those connections across campus, um, you know, beyond the larger schools and units, um, I think that's really when we're adding value and bringing something new to the research enterprise that, that didn't exist before. You know, I would add for people that may not realize this also, we don't serve just the Ann Arbor campus, our Office of Research. So we serve Dearborn and Flint uh, for all the same pieces that we just talked about now. Um, in the same way that those campuses that our individual schools here make their own decisions about their, about their research and, and how they're helping their faculty, so do those campuses. But we are here both in the support of their IRBs and their animal use programs as well as in um, helping them in their other compliance and other catalyzing functions across the campuses. So, so our office is, is truly across the University of Michigan. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And from you know my perspective with technology transfer, we we see a lot of it actually, um, especially out of the Dearborn campus. Um, you know, they rank up there with some of our more productive colleges here on the Ann Arbor campus. So a lot of people don't don't recognize that, but we are providing that service for them as well. And, want to do more to help support them, connect them with industry, and support their faculty and their efforts to have impact coming out of their research. Um, one other piece, just to pick at the Business Engagement Center for, for a minute, um, you know, one thing that I really like about their model is that it also reports to development. So they have access to these companies and information about who from the University of Michigan is an alum that's a decision maker about these companies. And how can we leverage that to reignite or start a conversation about sponsoring research at the University of Michigan? And, and yes, those alums are absolutely always going to do the best thing by the company that they serve. But all things being equal, the research here is fantastic. So there's no reason if they're looking for an university to work with that they shouldn't give serious consideration to the University of Michigan. So having you know that connectivity um, between these two programs at the university, I think, is, is really something special and something unique to Michigan. So you know, back um, then uh, towards the federal <coughs> research funding. So it's easy to forget when we sit at the university and we know how important this funding is, and, and we know the great work that it enables. Um, I wonder if sometimes we're not doing a good enough job communicating that story to the society that funds this research and, you know, specifically, um, you know, to the folks in D.C. that make these decisions. Um, you know, we, we have lots of data around this, um, but are, are we doing a good enough job getting that story um, told in D.C.? Are we as the University of Michigan or as you know, universities across the country, are we explaining to society the benefit of this research? I, I think research is a completely misunderstood word, um, even on campus by many of our faculty and certainly to the public at large. And um, I think we all have to work um, better to even help people understand that the, the best connotations of research is really the generation of new knowledge for our public good. Um, and not this esoteric weird thing that people in lab coats do, you know, on their on their time uh, that only benefits them, and then sits in a journal paper 
somewhere on the shelf, which is really not what the vast majority of faculty are working towards here on campus. So um, I'll tell a little story and then I'll give a little bit of the numbers. So, um, you know, much of the research that happens here has much broader impact than whatever the knowledge even is generated um, for the local economy, um, for services to our community, for services to, um, to patients at times. You know, so for an, an example that I give um, from my own work from many years ago is I had um, a large amount of federal funding to develop some programs to really generate best knowledge around uh, health behavior programs from hospitals. And that was great, and the, point, the main point of the project from the NIH was to generate this new knowledge so that we could then give that to other investigators around the country. That's the stated purpose of that. But the side effect of that is the work was going on in Flint. So we hired 20 local people in Flint to work on it who got those dollars and those jobs. Um, and by the way, all the people who came through our health system who participated in that got free services, free health care, free HIV tests. All of that was part of the federal dollars and impacted the economy locally and the, and the health of the community that went far beyond. And so that's the story. But uh, to give that to a little bit of a better frame, we have, fortunately on campus here, because on campus here we have one of everything, um, we have the most amazing institute on research and innovation and science, uh, science, IRIS. And if you don't know it, I really encourage you to go and look at their website. And they develop reports both for us here as well as for universities around the country uh, to help us understand and explain that kind of economic impact. Because the economic impact of our research is, is not even just what I just talked to you about. But so for example, let's say I am a bench researcher. Well, I have to buy my test tubes from somebody. Well, I often buy them from a particular place in a particular county where that is generating jobs. That research is generating jobs all the way down. And they help quantify that. So through our information from IRIS, we were able to announce recently that the U of M, the U of M research, just the U of M research, contributed $4.7 billion, billion dollars to the national economy through vendor contracts and subcontracts between 2002 and 2017. That does not even begin to get at, that research that was done during that time also vastly changed all kinds of things from healthcare to the way we think about circuits to the way we think about the screen on our iPhone, all those things as well. But it also generated this benefit to the economy and that, that local benefit to the economy where we're anchored here is only gonna be stronger when it's measured it actually impacts communities and states across the country. But certainly we're here in Michigan. It benefits Michigan the most, for sure, as a state in our local economy. This kind of information really helps us highlight the impact that research, university research folks have, um, which we, we need to do a better story and telling, a, a job in telling that story. Um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, as Washington remains the interested, interesting and complicated place that it is, um, telling the story of what research universities do and what the value to those research universities are beyond the really important fundamental tasks of educating our students and generating a pipeline for uh, jobs and our economy and new knowledge. This research university also has this whole separate economic benefit um, uh, for, our, for our state and our system. Um, and that's part of when we, when we talk about our mission um, to have research that's generated to serve the nation and the world and, and create public good, that's, that's part of that. Mm -hmm. I think that's great and I, I echo your sentiment to, to look at the Institute for Research on Innovation and Science. Um, the, the director of that group also has a book called um, uh, research, research Universities, Universities for the Public Good. That's right. And one of the, the ideas you know, I, I say that he wrote the book, I wish I could write. But one of, one of the ideas he conveys is that, you know, we're building this capacity through research universities, through the networks that um, our faculty have, both with each other across this huge campus, but also connected to the global research community and the national research community. We're building this network and this, this really precious infrastructure that if, if nothing bad happens, in our, in our society or, or in the world, we're generating new knowledge and it's having all these other wonderful, measurable, tangible benefits. Um, but you know, when we have a crisis, we have this capacity for all of these researchers to turn um, their labs and pivot to focus on that problem. And I, I think we have a lot of great examples of that, um, you know, both nationally, 
um, before the NIH was even funding um, Zika research. Um, you know, there were publications on Zika just from uh, virologists who had the capacity to pivot and start studying it. Um, and I, I think we have specific examples here as well. But I, I also think there's something to just kind of that precious capacity to help society adapt to change. And, you know, as, as Jason Owen Smith describes it, prepare for that uncertain future. And I think the students that we have are, are um, one of the driving forces for that, right? So faculty, especially as they get up in rank in years, you know, get sometimes a little bit more in one niche. Uh, but working with students constantly, either uh, in, in the labs or in graduate schools, allows us to not stay in that focus because they're forever pivoting towards whatever the next piece is. Um, and that helps uh, both our faculty stay more relevant and also helps us be um, a quick adapter to the needs of society and the world because they're constantly pushing us and getting us to, to pivot in that way. Absolutely. Um, you know, one, one other point on the messaging that I, I think we can all, you know, it's important for everybody in this room to understand as well um, and to help be ambassadors for the, you know, the role that, you know, a, a public research university like Michigan plays. But, you know, in creating this, this new knowledge, we're often creating knowledge in kind of a pre-competitive space and making it widely available for others to use and benefit from. And, and you see evidence of this in, in so many ways. But there was um, one study that looked at all of the FDA-approved drugs um, to receive approval between, um, I think it was 2010 and 2016. And they found that every single FDA-approved drug relied on NIH-funded research. They cited towards NIH-funded publications and research um, when preparing their approvals. And I mean, I think that alone tells a really important story. If you don't invest in the NIH, and if they're not able to invest in universities, we're not gonna get these new medicines. Um, you know, we're not gonna get these new therapeutics. Um, likewise, on the patenting side, um, They've been able to show that, yeah, a little over a third of U.S. patents cite towards federally funded research. So again, you know, we're putting, you know, research out there, we're publishing it, um, and even if it is just a publication, society's benefiting from that. Others are learning, and they're able to take that early knowledge and, you know, use it in a in a way that becomes useful in the forms of new patents, new innovations, new drugs, even if even when they're not developed on our campus. And we know that many times that these new and useful things are indeed developed on our campus, and that's an important part of what we do through our technology transfer efforts to help move those innovations out. Um, so I guess that's a good segue. We can start talking about um, you know tech transfer and um, really the work that we're doing. So when when I you know think about um, the why. You know, we had a great conversation with the Tech Transfer National Advisory Board this morning and always start with why. So why um, is the University of Michigan, why do we have a tech transfer office? Why would any um, university invest in that activity? And, and the real reason, um, you know, for me is our efforts serve to amplify the public good of research and the public impact of research that occurs on our campus. I mean, fundamentally, that's why we're here. If um, launching a new startup, filing a patent, doing a license, connecting a faculty member with an entrepreneur, connecting them with a company, if that can serve the higher purpose of getting their research um, into broader use in the world, that's what we're gonna do. It's, it's fundamentally about impact, and we've been having a lot of conversations about that. And, just, I'm sure the audience would also love to hear some thoughts you have about the role of technology transfer in generating impact. Yeah, I think the, the office and the, the mission around tech transfer for the university, as you're saying, is um, has, has many important outputs and, and certainly there are opportunities there to um, have companies start up and uh, have you know, really exciting moments uh, in that matter. But the, the office is really working on a lot more than just patentable devices and therapeutics. Um, it's working really to, to do this, which is to take the foundational research across the university um, and find help investigators and, and faculty find a way to move that to a next place, whether that's a license for open source use, 
um, or other mechanisms that they can get that out more broadly to um, uh, folks beyond the academia that can use them. And you've had some first-hand experience with this as well, and um, I, I think that'd be interesting for the for the audience to hear about. And when I first learned about it, you were you were almost surprised that it was the Office of Tech Transfer that was helping your research group um, and move some of their content, you know, out of the university. Yeah, so uh, as an earlier researcher, so one of the, um, our, our group had developed a couple different software applications, um, primarily meant to help um, uh, patients in the emergency department change their health behavior in positive ways. So one of the things our group developed was um, a, a self a standalone computer application um, that teenagers and young adolescents and our college students, I might add, when they came through our emergency department, um, could use that was tailored in a health behavior way that was fairly sophisticated um, that was done with NIH money uh, that would help them think about their drinking here on the weekends and how they could stay safer and that was that was one application we had and another was uh, a software application that we developed that also had an app component to it um, that we were using with uh, adolescents in Flint to help them think about their violence and their safety in the communities no one in our group is particularly interested in uh, turning that into a startup, but we, it's found to be best practices. We found that we were able to keep adolescents safer from their binge drinking on the weekends, and we found that we were able to keep people, the, the teenagers in Flint, safer from fights and violence. And we don't want to hold on to that technology. We want that technology to go out into the world. And so with that, um, we met with the office and developed a, a good, uh, white label version of that that we're now um, increasingly able we have hospitals coming to us the CDC has it on their website as best practices and then other hospitals they say how can we get this and as a faculty researcher not knowing very much about this in early times I didn't know how they could get this but I knew there was a way that it would be really a shame if they couldn't get this and so the office worked with our team to be able to make a plan so the other hospitals can have this technology that we developed and use it for their good Absolutely. And I, I think there's this, um, this misperception that the office will only get involved and only support a faculty if, you know, whatever they're working on can generate revenue for the university. And there are so many cases, and this is one, where it's, it, it's not intended to generate revenue. Those are, you know, no-cost licenses. It just turns out that that is the best mechanism we have as an academic institution to get this great content out into broader use in the world. And, you know, we're an organization and an office that believes in impact. And so we will devote considerable effort to helping, you know, faculty like you and your team be able to take that work and, and get it into the hands of, of others so that um, they can benefit from this wonderful federally funded research um, that led to these great interventions that have broad application. Um, so, so that's something I think we have to, you know, think about how we explain that and storytelling and, and certainly today is, you know, a piece of that to make sure that faculty across campus understand that if there is, you know, if their ultimate goal is impact, there's probably a way we can help them achieve that. Um, I think we've got, you know, a few examples, you know, certainly you're one and we could, you know, amplify those um, with the content licenses we do. We, um, but we also have stories of startup companies where the faculty member, um, what they wanted to see was impact. And the best way to have that impact was to build a sustainable business. Um, you know, for me, one of the, the best examples of this came from our law school. And we had a faculty member there, J.J. Prescott, who realized that a lot of, for a lot of people, um, responding to an outstanding warrant, settling a misdemeanor fine, um, was very problematic. They might not have had transportation to, to get to the courthouse, they might not have had childcare, maybe they couldn't take the time off of work. And when they weren't able to respond to it, it began to escalate, the fines escalated. Suddenly there was a warrant also involved and they just began avoiding the court altogether. And he realized that if, if there were a way to get the judge and the citizen to, to sit down, they could probably come to a solution. And so what he did was create a software platform called Matterhorn to help enable those 
uh, facilitate those transactions. And um, he realized if he wanted it to be something more than just an interesting project out of the law school or something more than um, a technology that was just used in Washtenaw County, um, that there needed to be a sustainable business around it. And so he had no interest in, in becoming the entrepreneur, but we were able to connect him um, with a wonderful local entrepreneur who has since built Court Innovations, and they are providing uh, the Matterhorn solution to courthouses around the country. I think the most recent number was 60,000 individuals had settled their outstanding fines and tickets and warrants using this platform. So, you know, I think there's this, this big untapped opportunity of faculty across campus who want to have this kind of impact that have, you know, the research and the understanding in their, in their domains of expertise to know how to design a solution. And if we can help them find a way for that to become sustainable um, and to become a business, we want to do that, even if it's not going to be this high, you know, even if it's not going to be you know, a multi-billion dollar return to the university, we want those 60,000 people to have access to that technology. That kind of impact is, is what we want to see. So, I don't know if you have thoughts about that. No, I think it's really well said. We still like the other kind. I we do add. like the other kind. <laughs> <laughs> but we do, we do have a portfolio across, and really, and the, and the mission is across both of those. Yeah. Um, well, we see that as well. I mean, even though, Within University Tech Transfer, the revenue tends to come from therapeutics. That's true at University of Michigan, and that's true at universities around the country. When you have a home run, it's usually out of the portfolio of therapeutics. And we certainly had some of those here, and we hope to have many, many more. Um, but even there, the faculty that are engaged in that work aren't doing it because you know they see this potential this very unlikely financial return at the end of 15 years of hard work. They're doing it because they want to impact a patient population. And, um, you know, we, we see this. Um, today we'll have DGD Pharma will be present at the um, event at 3 p.m. And when we talked to um, uh, Mukesh Niyadi, the faculty member that, that really drove the creation of that company, he said there were many times where it would have been easy for him to pivot um, away from the problem he was trying to, to solve um, with this um, cancer population and go to an area that was more heavily NIH funded. But he really saw the opportunity to have impact. And so he had to kind of keep his, his research lab leaner than it might have been if he had um, you know, chased these other opportunities. But he really wanted to have impact. The college saw the importance of this and supported him in those endeavors. Um, so I. I know I keep coming back to this theme of impact. I think we've got a, a lot of work there to do, both in our, our storytelling and, and our outreach there. Um, switching to um, a different topic, uh, when you were accepting your um, named chair recently, I um, was very appreciative to be able to, to attend and sit in the audience, and you gave a really great speech where you described your career. and. One thing I really appreciated was you said, I'm, I'm not gonna whitewash all of this. Um, and I wanna be honest, and I wanna talk about how there were times where um, I, you know, I thought about leaving research. It would have been easy to focus more on uh, practicing medicine that might have helped more with student loans. And so I wonder if you could speak to the, the leakiness of the research pipeline. Yeah, we do. We have a we have a big problem with the leakiness of our pipeline, um, and that and that leakiness is only more so certainly across gender lines and and underrepresented minorities. So, um, a lot of faculty, but but even across broadly, a lot of faculty come in thinking that they want to be engaged in research and then eventually want to move on to having impact in these other ways, and do get dissuaded uh, along that path. Um, I certainly, as, as Kelly mentioned, had three young children at home and we're trying to balance what, what is an academic career which is involved with both clinical medicine and teaching and of, of students as well as getting my own research portfolio going and it's, it's always easy, it's easier at that point to do the thing that you're best trained in which is to fall back on the medicine part and not do the part that's scary and hard and make decisions about writing those grants on the weekend and writing proposals and making and pitches, right, for your, for your funding. And so it is a big struggle. We know we lose um, about 40% of women within the first four years of having a new child at home and about 20% of men. 
uh, during that same time. And so that's a big problem. And then later on, we, we've lost them for every step of, of leadership along the way. Um, and with that, we know the diversity of our thought is less and the diversity um, at our tables is less and that we need to have, keep all those voices in the room. And um, So there's a lot of strategies around this. I think uh, some of those that are really important to think about are, um, one, I appreciate that Kelly and I are here today and I think having um, a strong voice in leadership and diversity of leadership can't be overstated. Um, I, I, I can't help but point out for in this conversation, yes, feel free to clap, thank you, um, uh, that we're in the Michigan League here today, which many of you may not know. You know, I just thought when I first came here it had all these great pictures of women on it and how progressive Michigan was to um, have this place that just had this great, all these great images of women all over. And then I realized, of course, we weren't allowed in the union. <laughs> and so we had to have our own building because we couldn't mix, right? So we've, we've come a long way since then, but there's an awful long way to go. Um, uh, in, in academia for sure and the research pipeline is worse than academia is generally and success in research is also what gets one to leadership across the university in many ways so some of the strategies that I've found that have worked um, as I've worked with junior faculty one um, uh, mentorship obviously diverse mentorship um, uh, and and not just female mentorship some of the best mentors that have kept me in the field have been my male mentors who have really advocated and sponsored me, and the difference between mentorship and sponsorship can't be overstated. Um, the men that actively put me forward for things and that have put my other junior faculty forward for positions, not just mentored them on how they should do it and recommended them for positions and recommended them for awards, can't be overstated. And you need to do that more actively with your young um, women and underrepresented minority faculty because they don't think that they really are applicable for those positions often because, um, because they've been, been degraded along the way for the path. The other thing um, is peer networks. Peer networks of junior faculty helping each other. Um, mixed peer networks, both of men and women together. Um, but those peer networks are really critical um, in early research careers for, for those faculty to be leaning on each other. Um, because on, on the weekends and the evenings when all of us are doing uh, all of the research that we're expecting our faculty to do, and that's when a lot of them are doing that around their teaching times and other times, they need to be well connected to a community of other people that are really inspiring them and invigorating them. We know that faculty lose out of the pipeline when they become isolated um, and when they feel like they're doing this on their own or they're not mission driven. Um, and those, those values are better and easier to keep together when, uh, when they've developed good peer networks to lean on each other. And, and that's where collaboration really also fits in. And collaboration, um, we know that some of the best research happens on the edge of disciplines and as they overlap. And so, Again, a good place, another pitch for multidisciplinary research, which is one of the things our office is really engaged in doing. Um, but with that is an opportunity for team science, and that team science is really good for keeping the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I haven't heard the, the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. It's entirely different. Yeah. Yeah. Men mentorship is telling, telling one you know, what they should do and helping them fix their paper and helping them edit their grant. Sponsorship is, Kelly, I'm putting you forth for this award, right. um, and I'm recommending you to the board to do this, and that those are different. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. And we need men to do that, yeah. because mostly you have a lot of the leadership positions. So. Yeah. No, and I, I think that you know, transfers really nicely into trends that we see on you know, the, the tech transfer and, and the patenting side, where we know, you know as, a, as a nation, um, about 18% of patents list a woman as an inventor. And that's pretty dismal, <laughs> given the population. Um, we know that to get to patent parity, you know, where 50% you know, of, of the patents have at least one woman listed as an inventor, it's going to take until about 2090 at current rates of improvement. So that's, you know, that's kind of seven. troubling. <laughs> and, you know, one of the, I think that sponsorship piece there is so important because you know, even even when you have an equal number of women in, in, in STEM disciplines, which we don't have yet, but even if we did, women often don't see themselves as being ready to submit that invention disclosure to the tech transfer office. Um, but if someone tells them, that's a great idea, you should try to get a patent on that, or you should go talk to tech transfer, that's a completely different conversation, and I, I think you know, because a lot of the 
inventors who have worked with tech transfer in the past tend to be men. It's again very important that you know the the male faculty and inventors sponsor their um, junior female colleagues and underrepresented colleagues and tell them that's a worthwhile idea. You should go see tech transfer and see if you can get that patent. So I think that's something important to, to think about. We have started you know tracking our data here and I am you know happy to say that we're better than the national average. Universities in general tend to be. We are at the University of Michigan as well in terms of including um, women inventors on our patents. But I think measuring the data there is important. Seeing what we can do to improve it is important. Um, I've heard from you know deans around campus that Women tend to be over-recognized for service and under-recognized for research accomplishments. And since research accomplishments tend to be weighted more heavily, um, I think it's important for us to start to measure those differences um, and understand you know, how we can change them. It's part of the pipeline then into because um, uh, that pipeline of research is then what leads to how people get to your office. So we have to work all along the pipeline. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think um, we put out, uh, we've got about five minutes left, so I think we've got time to, to go a little bit further. Um, so we put out a request for questions on Twitter, and we didn't get any. But um, we also put out a request for questions on a platform called Givitas. And Givitas is, it's going to be a plug, it's based on research out of um, the Ross School of Business, Wayne Baker. and his graduate student, um, now Adam Grant at Wharton, and it's around reciprocity and the idea that generous people are in general more happy and make more engaged employees and companies with reciprocity tend to do better. So we, um, that's a University of Michigan startup. Um, Larry Free, the CEO, is in the audience. He gave us a pretty decent deal on a license to give it to us. Thanks, Larry. Um, but we put out a request for um, questions on give it to us. And, Kind of unsurprisingly, we got many more responses um, because it, it does a good job of priming people to give. Um, so I'll read one of the questions. Um, this came from Dave Prigorka, a venture partner at Barrett Capital and a mentor and resident at U of M Tech Transfer. And um, Dave wrote that um, he saw that um, last Thursday, the Regents approved the creation of a new fund to support U of M startup companies. And he would like to know more about its purpose, its target size, and why it's important to the university and to the state. So we've got two minutes. You want to tackle that? You can start. All right, I'll start. Um, so I will say this has been a program that's been a long time coming. Um, we recognize that as the nation's largest public university that's in a small town um, in an area that has been underserved by venture capital, Access to early stage seed capital is one of our rate limiting factors for growth um, of our startup companies, and we've been wanting to address that. Um, so with the support of the Tech Transfer National Advisory Board and, and Rebecca and university leadership, uh, we've been able to um, create a new source of funding for startup companies coming out of the University of Michigan. Um, it was approved with an initial initial gift of 250,000. We hope to eventually grow that to 20 million and have it be an evergreen source of funding for University of Michigan startup companies at their earliest stage of need. Um, so that's the, the vision behind it. Um, we're actively working with the Tech Transfer Board and with university leadership on how we socialize this idea more broadly, how we attract more donors to, to help um, us really launch this effort. Um, so that's the general plan. Yeah, I think it's, I'm so excited about this and I really appreciate both the board and, and your office and all the work that's gone into it for many, many years now for it's been a four-year idea, I think, coming along and... Um, or 20, depending on who you ask. 20, depending on who ask. Yeah, history is short here. Um, so, you know, it's important that uh, this, that, that our there's so many great things about living in the Midwest. I've been here for 20 years. I, I never thought I would say I'm from the Midwest, but here I am, it's been 25 years. Um, and it, it's great to be here, and we would like more folks uh, who are rolling out with, with companies also to stay here. And we know that um, investing and getting funds for, their, for the, these early pieces is sometimes easier on the coasts. And we want to fix that problem, um, again, which gets back us to in, impacting our local economy, and really making sure that our researchers here have, have the best opportunities. 
Absolutely. Um, so just to, to put a point on that, you know, why it's important for the state. In 2018, University of Michigan startup companies, that calendar year, they raised $670 million. That was raised by 31 companies. 16 of the 31 left the state. They raised $610 million. The 15 that stayed raised the Delta. We want to help be part of changing that equation. We want to help companies be able to stay here. I know from conversations with our board, conversation uh, with people on the coast, that as a community, as an ecosystem, we need to be able to fund our startup companies as a region up through Series A and Series B. If we can do that, it's much easier for them to stay here and attract follow-on capital from the coast. So that's really our goal. We think by influencing this early stage gap for our startup companies, we're going to be able to move the needle and really catalyzing things here in Ann Arbor and in Southeast Michigan. So I want to thank Rebecca for her support of that vision, um, for helping us get um, a 20 or a four year uh, program approved through the uh, University of Michigan Board of Regents. And I want to thank you for agreeing to be part of this chat. This has been great. So fun. Thank you all.
Good afternoon. Um, my name is Min Yan Liu. I'm the chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this year's recipients of the Distinguished University Innovator Award, Professor David Blau and Professor Dennis Sylvester. I'm particularly proud because they are both professors of electrical engineering and computer science. Together, the two of them have been working as a team for about 18 years. They have won numerous multi-million dollar research awards and built a very large and vibrant research uh, group. And through that process, they've also founded a number of startups. The two most prominent are MB Micro, that commercializes their innovation in low power computing, and Cubeworks, that commercializes their innovation in miniaturized computers. Uh, their, uh, their Cube, their cube millimeter, cube millimeter computer is now recognized as the world's tiniest computer and on display at the Computer Museum in Mountain View, California. And it has the promise to become the ideal candidate for the future of the Internet of Things. And now let me invite the two of them up here and tell you the rest of their story. Thank you. for the introduction, wherever, wherever you went, there you are. Um, so uh, it's a great honor to uh, receive this award, especially next to my good friend and, and colleague, David. Um, so we have a, a set of slides just to go through um, some of the background on, on things that we've done uh, together to, um, uh, to merit the uh, award. So we're going to go through those. We're going to provide some background uh, and talk about some trends uh, in, the, in, the, in the field. And then we're going to move to a panel where we'll talk about uh, commercialization efforts in um, post CMOS uh, machine learning era. So uh, I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, so the three companies, so Mingyan just mentioned two of these three companies, but these are the three companies that together we've had a hand in in different ways. Um, first of all, Ambic Micro is, is, is the, probably the, the long, uh, largest and has been around the longest. This is um, what I would say is the most conventional uh, path where one of uh, our PhD students, Scott Hansen, uh, decided that he really believed in the technology that we had developed with him and other students in the late uh, 2000s, uh, that decade, and uh, basically uh, said, you know, I want to make this uh, into a company, and together with, with David and my, myself. So uh, we did that. Um, we really learned a lot, at least I did, I think, in that process of how you move from writing research papers where the improvements that you're showing uh, on, in that paper over state of the art uh, are very large, and then by the time you uh, get to a point where you can manufacture that instead of building one test chip, you've lost some of that advantage, right? And the question is, how little of that can you give back? Because when you take it to market, you still want to have a significant advantage if you want to displace or dislodge existing um, existing companies. So this was a much this this is a company that moved into uh, ultra low power microcontrollers, which are the sort of the brains of many of the Internet of Things and other devices, wearables and things like that. So we had to displace uh, existing uh, uh, companies to do that. QWorks uh, was a bit different. Uh, Cubeworks is, uh, we started very small, we didn't go for uh, big VC money right away like Ambic wound up being funded by Kleiner Perkins and other uh, very large VCs, but Cubeworks started a little bit smaller and leaner and, and really sort of grew organically in Ann Arbor. Um, and uh, it really focused a lot on building systems as opposed to individual components or chips. And also we had to define new application areas for Cubeworks because there weren't existing applications for the cubic millimeter uh, designs that, that Mingyan alluded to. So these were completely new devices and, and, and that's been a really exciting time and David can talk more about that later because he's very um, uh, involved in that now. And Mythic, uh, Dave and I are not founders of Mythic. Mythic is, an, is, a, is a startup company that licensed our technology and it was founded by our former PhD student Dave Fick and a postdoc of ours 
uh, Mike Henry. And so we've been involved in different ways in this. And what's interesting about Mythic is that they've really um, grown very rapidly uh, because of the machine learning wave that we'll be talking about in the panel. Uh, and so it's been very interesting to see that go from you know, three or four employees to 75 employees in a very short amount of time and, and all the good and bad that comes with that, right? So, um, so going on, I think, to the next slide. So uh, we wanted to just give you a quick picture of like how the progression happened. And uh, so I'm going to go very fast, uh, but this is really the start. Uh, and I'm going to analyze all of these graphs for you now. Um, so uh, this is kind of the theory, uh, and this is really actually the start of our overall work, uh, where we had a student, uh, Bo Zai, who is now long graduated, and actually uh, went to a, a, a large semiconductor company and then went into business himself. Um, uh, found this sort of energy optimal point for operating circuits, and I'll leave it at that. Um, and we published this, and this was really an analysis paper. And this gave us the idea that, wow, we can actually bring down the power a lot further than we had thought. And then we started thinking about how to actually implement that in circuits. Uh, and so, uh, and we sort of tried to show you a very quick progression here, uh, where we started out with a very little processor at the very top there, and just try to see, well, can we take this new kind of uh, sub-threshold design, as it's called, uh, and actually implement something and get it to actually work. Uh, we published that, and then we were encouraged, and then we built a slightly larger version of that. And then we started growing it, and I think this was very critical, because we had initially, we did only like maybe a couple blocks, uh, but then over time, uh, we started making entire processors that were really functional, including commercial architectures. Uh, so that was another pivotal point, I think, in our sort of path to commercialization, that we didn't just stay with sort of toy examples, but we took it also into industrial application processors. Um, and then we started building systems, and eventually we got to the interocular uh, pressure monitor, which was a complete little system that you could implant, at least in theory, uh, in your eye. Uh, it worked, mostly. And um, it was really tiny, and it was really a, a first of its kind. It was really, uh, I think, quite ahead of any other systems of that size. Um, and then something uh, very interesting happened. Um, and so this is a quote from the uh, movie The Field of Dreams. I don't know if any of you remember it. Uh, but it really stuck with us because we published uh, that paper with the interocular pressure sensor at a circuit conference uh, in 2011. And then what happened was that we got all these responses, and they weren't from circuit designers, which is what we were hoping for, you know, congratulating us on our really good circuit design. Um, in fact, circuit designers were a little, you know, hesitant about what we were doing, uh, but we got lots and lots of interest from people that wanted something like that. Uh, they wanted a little, tiny little sensor of some kind. Uh, and so this is just a, a listing of the ones that we got in the first few weeks. We were getting lots and lots of emails, uh, you know, we started sort of sorting through them. Uh, a lot of them, we were like, well, this is actually not even possible with the laws of physics that we have today because they wanted something really amazing. Uh, but some of them were very, very interesting, but they were also all very, very different. Um, and so we really started to think of like, well, if this, we have this technology, we've built this really tiny, complete system now. How do we now, you know, make that feasible for all these different application spaces? Uh, and so we kind of moved to a modular approach, uh, which I won't go into a lot of detail, but by stacking different chips on top of each other and making that very modular and being able to uh, switch chips in and out, uh, you know, we could actually, we felt, address a lot of different markets, a lot of different applications um, to try to kind of open up this new sort of very small millimeter scale computing uh, field. Um, and so that became uh, what is now known the Michigan Micromote. This is sitting on a, what is it, is it a nickel? I think it's a nickel. Uh, so you can see how small and tiny it is. This is on display, as Min Yang mentioned, uh, it's a computer history museum. And we've made one actually even smaller than that. So, so that's kind of the technology route. Uh, Dennis will take you now through the commercialization uh, that sort of went alongside with that. Yes, yeah, so this just gives you a timeline of the companies that I introduced at the beginning. Um, it's not as exciting as the nickel picture, so I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, so you can see that when David and I started working together, it was around 2001. 
and we were working on different topics, not what we're doing now. Uh, and around 2004, with the paper that he took the clip of, um, then we turned our attention to this uh, to this area. Um, and uh, you know, Ambic was founded in 2010. Uh, it moved to Austin a year later, um, and uh, has grown um, to about 80 employees. If you look down at the bottom, and they've shipped 50 million chips. Uh, to date, and uh, so that's been very um, uh, successful. Uh, our relationship with ARM, so David mentioned the commercial microcontrollers and processors that we were building even in the research domain, was based on a, uh, a research relationship that, that we had at the university. So that was able to basically parlay into uh, a, a you know, strategic investment from ARM in AMBIC, uh, a seat on the board, and a really nice um, uh, agreement with them to basically uh, push that forward. So that was something that we really benefited from the university and our research relationships. Um, a couple of years later, Cubeworks and um, Mythic, uh, which was called Isocline initially, uh, were founded. Mythic also moved to Austin. Uh, we'll touch on maybe some of this uh, in the panel. Uh, you'll notice a trend of some companies moving out of Ann Arbor in this area and of some other companies staying in Ann Arbor. So there's you know, big decisions to be made there that we had to, to, we had to deal with as well. Um, and um, just to fast forward to today, so Mythic is, um, has not shipped its first product. It's, um, uh, it changed its focus in 2015. It's an interesting, interesting story uh, relevant to the panel as well. So Mythic started by looking at uh, an analog computation approach to um, basically doing GPS correlation, so doing correlators, calculating correlation coefficients uh, to compute where the satellites are and therefore to compute your position. So they had a really good, interesting approach. We published it at this leading, uh, world's leading circuit design conference and it was really interesting. And so they went around to pitch it to venture capitalists and they said, oh, by the way, we also have some ideas on doing machine learning in memory compute, but our main thing is this GPS thing. And they said, forget the GPS thing, we just care about the machine learning thing. So they've completely changed gears uh, and, and raised, I think, about $85 million in a small number of years. So, Although they almost went bankrupt in the process. <laughs> I think thick, uh, yeah, mortgage his garage or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then meanwhile, Cubeworks' latest status is, is that they have uh, shipping the shipping products into two markets and they've raised a smaller, more modest amount of money because, again, taking a different strategy and a different approach to, uh, to uh, building a company. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, Ambic really went into a market that was already existing and was trying to displace parts that were already out there with lower power versions, uh, competing, out-competing them, essentially. And so that was a, a much faster path, whereas, as Dennis has also mentioned, Cubeworks is really trying to find kind of a new space uh, that is really not yet very much established. And so uh, we've taken a very different approach intentionally, uh, and it's taken uh, a longer path, uh, but they're doing uh, quite well as well. So um, these are some of the people that need to be acknowledged as part of this award. The award is, is at least as... Uh, uh, much due to the students uh, that uh, are leading these companies as to David and I. Um, and so these are some old pictures. I think 2009, 2011, uh, the three pictures over here. Dave Hartman, you all know, and he's in the audience somewhere, there he is, uh, was uh, a, a significant mentor uh, for Scott Hansen, the founder of Ambic in the early days, uh, and is uh, very much appreciated. So Scott's sitting there looking up at me, it looks like, uh, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, up top, the, uh, Dave Fink is right there, the founder of Mythic, and a uh, uh, very uh, strong uh, CTO there. And on the top right, Dave is talking to Xeon Fu, who is the CEO of Cubeworks, and Yuho Kim, who is the CTO of, of, of Cubeworks. So you can see uh, different companies represented here. Now Scott, you can see here, looks you know, really young. He was just a young guy going out raising money for this company. But after nine years in the startup game, he, he, he looks like this now. So he <laughs> said that to me yesterday. Uh, asking for a selfie. So, um, so you all know this well, right? He's much wiser now. <laughs> <laughs> so, one time thing. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of you have also, you've heard a lot about uh, machine learning. The other big trend uh, today is, uh, is also IoT, Internet of Things. And so we wanted to sort of highlight how, uh, what we're doing and in general what is happening with uh, IoT. And so, um, you know, it's interesting because IoT actually is working off of a trend that many people don't know about, which is called Bell's Law. Uh, most of you might have heard um, of Moore's Law, uh, but this is actually was coined around the same time, and it's showing that uh, what's happening is that computing systems, as we go through the time, are, are shrinking actually in size. 
It's something we all unconsciously know, but we don't always necessarily uh, kind of uh, verbalize uh, and express. So uh, early computing systems were, you know, bulky, huge, and expensive, and now, you know, your computing system is really your cell phone, right, which has more compute power than these old systems. Um, and so actually, this is uh, around the time that we started do this, doing this work, we also saw this law, which was much more obscure at the time, it's become more known now. Um, and so one of our goals was also to try to uh, get on this roadmap and push it further along. And where we really are now is this Internet of Things, uh, moderate sized sensors uh, that are connected to the Internet, that sense the environment around us. Uh, they're not interacting with us directly uh, through keyboards and displays, but they're uh, taking sensing readings of what's going on in the environment or activating on it, um, and then communicating that through the web. And so we can expect, uh, and as we've tried to participate in, is to bring that further down, to make them smaller uh, to the millimeter scale. And so if this trend holds, the trend holds then we will be uh, part of that picture. Um, and we'll see that continuing even further. So, so. on the slide still, so the, the, the trend of miniaturization, the trend of um, uh, Internet of Things, these were things we knew about in the earlier days of our, our work in this area. The third, the third trend that's mentioned here was something that's really only about, you know, mostly about five years old. You can trace it back to about 12, actually 2012, but really a couple years later. Um, and, and that's machine learning. And so this is a, a slide that might help set up the panel. Uh, I, I was in a workshop in, in late March, uh, this year, and um, and this this person, uh, not, not, not Rudy Berger himself, but if someone else put this slide up, and it's total funding on the y-axis uh, for semiconductors uh, in blue, total semiconductor company funding by VCs, uh, and then the orange bar gives you an idea of how much of that is in uh, semiconductor companies that are devoted toward artificial intelligence or more specifically machine learning. And so what you can see, you see the blue bar has some trends and undulation, and, you know, that's that's pretty well known. Software is getting a lot more money, uh, at least in the last 10 years. But you can see that uptick after 15. And not only that, but if you look at orange, you can see that that percentage is growing rapidly. And if you look at the 19 bar, and this is what he stressed in his talk, which was amazing, was that that is not a projection. That was year to date on March 20th. So two and a half months into the year, there was almost, there was as much funding as all of 2017, basically. Almost all of it, 83% of it, was going to, to, to companies that were in that so-called ML or AI space. So that was pretty eye-opening for us. So it's a major, major trend. That's why companies like Mythic and others have been able to raise so much money so quickly, and now it's, it's becoming time to produce. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Uh, say thank you again for, um, for this uh, great award, and we really appreciate uh, being here. Thanks. So we'll move straight into the panel then, I guess. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. This mic. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, guys, for a great talk. Um, I was really disappointed. I thought you were going to go into details. <laughs> Every professor has to have at least one equation in their presentation, even if it's for a tech transfer award. Um, so good job, guys. Uh, all right, well, my name is Dave Wenseloff. Um, I will give these guys um, uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to set the stage uh, for this panel. So first of all, the title of this panel is Commercialization of Hardware Technologies in the post-CMOS machine learning era. So we realize this audience is probably not uh, technical, and so we want to start, um, so maybe give a bit of an overview of what all those mean uh, first. We'll have the panelists chime in on that. Um, and then we'll get into uh, more on the tech transfer side of things, and hopefully leave plenty of time for the audience to ask questions. So please start thinking about uh, what questions you want to ask the panelists. Um, so I'll start by just defining um, or Wikipedia's definition of machine learning. So let me read this to you for a sec. So what the heck is machine learning? Uh, machine learning is the scientific study of algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to perform a specific task without using explicit instructions, like how our, our current uh, computers work with programs, and, and instead relying on patterns and inference instead. 
Um, so it's a very specific, um, I call it an application specific computer looking at uh, statistical models relying on inference or patterns to make decisions. And I think the last part is pretty critical, to make decisions. So some examples of where ML is being used is obviously in things like your Amazon Echo, you know, for Alexa or the wake words. I'm, I'm not going to say it, but if you say her name on my iPhone, um, she'll immediately wake up. Those are examples um, of machine learning at the edge. Um, and I think this, this panel um, is a collection of experts in this field who have done research and really pushed the boundaries on what you can do in terms of machine learning uh, at the edge. So how do you increase performance? How do you increase efficiency? of machine learning at the edge to enable some pretty, I think, some pretty fascinating new applications. Um, I mentioned, you know, Echo Dots, things like that, but also think, also think about applications like, uh, you know, like caller ID for your doorbell. Um, that's a thing now. You can buy that, bring doorbells to it. Um, so someone will walk up to your door, and if, if your doorbell has seen them before and you've tagged them, you'll get an alert on your phone that says, who's at your door, before they even ring your doorbell. Um, so enabling things like that is the technology that we're talking about today. Um, okay, so uh, just, um, again, I mentioned I'll let these guys introduce themselves, but uh, real quick, just why we assembled this team. So this team um, has a lot of expertise, um, not only in uh, technology, but in tech transfer. Um, so maybe just to highlight some of that now, just how this technology has been transferred. I just jotted a few things down. First of all, I counted up startups uh, between all, all of us up here on the stage, and I counted nine, and maybe I missed one, but let me rattle them off. Ambic, Mythic, Cubeworks, Everactive, Movellus, Skygig, Crossbar, MemoryX, and SQL, uh, between the panelists on the stage. So I don't <laughs> So did I miss any? I know there might be, there might be some they can't talk about yet. So I'm, I'm, I'll ask two more times, and then, really? and then we'll see if they'll tell us. Um, but beyond just um, startups, um, another way that we transfer technology into the industry is through our students, right? They're our products. They're ultimately our products of this university. They go off and do some great things as well in large companies. Companies like Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, Samsung, ARM, the companies that are really building the backbone of all our compute devices, but then also companies like Google, Apple, um, Amazon, uh, who are consuming or generating tons and tons of data and need, need machine learning, for example, um, uh, uh, solutions to help them deal with that. Um, okay, so with that, that sets the stage. Um, you've already heard um, Dennis and David introduce themselves, so I'm going to skip them. Um, and Wei uh, okay. and Ritu, if you don't mind, just say a couple words uh, okay. to introduce yourselves. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks Dave. Uh, so I'm Wei Lu, I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering as well. Um, so I work on devices and computing architectures uh, based on these new devices. Uh, so as Dave said, I have two startups, so I bring the average down, so I only have two. <laughs> <laughs> so one is Crossbar, it's, uh, it was founded uh, here, but we moved to California, uh, it was founded in 2010. Um, the other is uh, Memrix, uh, it was just founded this year, it's based in Ann Arbor, so we want to stay here. <laughs> Hi y'all, I'm Ritu Das, I'm a, I'm a professor at uh, Computer Science and Engineering and um, my relation, I work in um, building custom computing systems for AI, machine learning, precision health and my relationship to this panel is, well I co-founded a company with David and another Satish who's not here, it's on precision health, it's called SQL so we are very excited about it, <laughs> working hard on it. Yeah. All right, thank you both. <clears throat> okay, so um, with that, we'll start, um, I think, uh, grilling these, this uh, collection of experts. So, uh, but uh, maybe just for starters, um, uh, just a bit of in, uh, introduction or background. Um, just wanted to ask them some questions, kind of to bring everyone up to speed. Um, but, you know, I know we're all professors, but we have to keep it simple, right, um, with our answers. So let's try and keep them short. So maybe for starters, we talk about the post-CMOS era. That's in the title of this panel, the post-CMOS era. So maybe for starters, we thought we'd introduce what is CMOS. So I want to ask Dennis this question. So can you tell us what is CMOS, what are some of the limits? Uh, and just while we're at it, um, can you give us a brief introduction to Moore's Law? 
Sure. So um, CMOS is the technological platform that our computing systems use today. So these are basically transistors uh, we use to do computation, storage, etc. For, for the most part. Um, CMOS has been the prevailing um, electronic technology for many decades, since probably around the early 70s. Um, and has uh, Moore's Law is a trend that many of you are probably familiar with, which says that essentially uh, the, 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 the scale or the size of transistors um, or the density that we can build these things with uh, improves exponentially with time, so roughly a factor of 2x denser or smaller transistors every couple of years. Um, and so that's taken us from originally technology, uh, transistor dimensions on the order of 10 micron in the early days of, of building these things, down to what's typically called today. So if you have uh, the latest iPhone 11 uh, or whatever it's called these days, uh, it says it's called seven nanometers. Uh, now that's not really the dimension of anything on that, on that chip, uh, but it is indicative of the scale of the, uh, or the, the density of the transistors that we have. So, so we've moved to this ridiculously small number like seven nanometers, and we're starting to approach fundamental physical limits in terms of how thin we can make layers, how short we can make transistor uh, gates without having them be completely leaking all the time, and things like that. So we ha we, there's clearly some bounds, and the most, most people today say that you know, seven nanometer, and then five nanometer, and then probably three nanometer, and that may be it, and maybe you might get two nanometer out of it, but that's it. And those things will happen in about five, six years. So those, those, those will be around. Five nanometer is gonna ship next year. So basically, we are at the very end of building transistors as we know it today. I think Wei will talk more about what's next. Yeah, actually. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dennis. Um, <laughs> so, so that is a great lead-in. Um, so we talked about the post-CMOS era um, and CMOS, Moore's Law um, ending. So Wei, if you could just tell us, um, you know, what do you see as some of the trends for new devices um, that are going to enable, uh, or new technologies that can enable uh, a continuation of this post CMOS era. Yep. So yeah, as Danny said, uh, so CMOS scaling is going to reach to an end very soon, right? So some of the scaling is already slowing down. That's why uh, our chips are getting hotter and hotter. And even if you can make all these devices, they are very very fast. You can't use them all the time. That's a term called dark silicon. So we can't, we can't, we we spend all this effort building the, these billion dollar transistors, but we are only using one quarter of the transistor we build. Okay, because they are getting so hot um, as we make them smaller. So, um, so, that's, uh, so we can't just keep making transistors smaller and soon we'll reach a limit that physically we can't make them smaller. So what's next? So there are a couple of directions. One is to instead of making them smaller in the little direction, we can go the vertical direction that's called 3D integration. So uh, we can gain the density by stacking devices on top of each other. But that's very, very challenging because of fabricating transistors require single crystalline silicon that require high temperature. But stacking them, you need to do it at a low temperature. So that's very challenging. So the other direction is to integrate memory with logic more closely. So one big challenge we have today is that we have separate memory and logic. So even though your transistors or CMOS are very, very fast, but your memory are far away, so when you want to read data and process the data, most of your energy cost and the bottleneck actually happens between moving data between memory and logic. So another important direction is actually integrating memory much closer with the logic so we can actually process data locally and that can also solve a lot of the challenges we have. So we, in the future, we, I mean, I think most people believe that to gain in performance, you can't just make the transistor smaller. That has been happening in the last 40 years, but it will soon stop. You actually have to gain performance by using, either using 3D integration or by merging memory with logic. So you can still continue to improve the performance, but not rely on making transistors smaller. Great, thanks. So this idea of moving memory closer to compute also kind of leads to compute in memory, uh, which is another um, uh, topic around machine learning you may have heard about. Um, so next question is for Ritu. So, um, so just because Moore's Law is slowing down, it's getting harder and harder to build these systems. There's, uh, as Wei had mentioned, parts of the chip that are not turned off because of heat. So we can't turn every part of the chip on. That doesn't slow down the demand. So everybody wants faster devices, longer range communication. The demand just keeps going and going, growing and growing. So Ritu, what, can you tell us a bit about what you see as some of the drivers? What's, what's the pull uh, for these technologies? Absolutely. Um, so I feel like there's a disruption coming from above and disruption coming from below in the computing mm -hmm. stack. Um, what is coming from above is that today computing systems have to crunch enormous amount of data. So for instance, a Facebook user um, 
would require to process half a gigabyte of data every, you know, every day or so. And if you go to fields like precision health, which I'm very excited about, um, an example is if you want to just do a liquid biopsy, one blood test, you need to process one terabyte of data per test, right? So, so we need like sort of uh, computing systems to keep up with that deluge of data and all that information processing. So that's the disruption which is coming from above. So we have to still build systems which are faster and better and more efficient. And from below, as Wei and uh, Dennis were saying, the technology is not keeping up, right? So we got to do something crazy, something wild here. <laughs> um, that's where all the invention is happening. And uh, one secret sauce, I believe, which we still have is kind of, um, so far, uh, all the computing systems were made um, very general so that they could work on anything, whether it's a banking software or it's a machine learning algorithm. The same class of hardware could work across all these different application domains, right? Um, so what's the shift and transition which is happening now is to tailor things out, to make custom systems, custom across the whole stack, uh, especially in the hardware. And by customizing, there's a 100x efficiency improvement or even 1000x, which is on the table for us to grab. And a lot of invention is happening in that space. So. Great, thanks. And then finally, question for David. So how do you see all these trends impacting research programs, both your own uh, research program and just across the country? Yeah, so I think uh, one of the things that's happening is that we essentially have to do more with less. Uh, in the past, in some sense, it was easy because we got faster and faster transistors from Weilu, uh, <laughs> and all we had to do is just put them together. And, uh, and now that is slowing down, and I often draw a diagram of a caterpillar on the board for my students, and it's kind of like the head of the caterpillar was way ahead of us, and it was very stretched out. And what's now happening is that that is slowed down, and so the whole caterpillar is sort of collapsing on itself. Uh, what it means is that uh, for us that are above that and the stack, we have to do more, uh, and so we have to squeeze out, like Rita was saying, more out of the transistors that we have. And we're doing that by changing the way that we're specializing the uh, structures for particular applications. Uh, it's by doing a lot more exotic things. Uh, if you think about your cell phone, actually, the circuits in there are way more sophisticated now, and a lot of the performance gains that are coming are not just because the transistor is better, but it's also because they're using much more exotic structures for the circuits, much uh, more advanced circuit structures. Um, and I think the other thing that's happening is that there is a shift in research towards systems. So people are now saying it's no longer about making just a little general purpose processor, but they're making higher level systems. And that's actually impacting students tremendously because now a student no longer can just know about a transistor uh, or even how to make a flip-flop or you know an adder but they have to know about machine learning or they have to know about vision algorithms uh, because they're making complete systems that go from transistors all the way up to the application and so I heard one professor lament that you know he felt uh, that they are now required to have students that uh, you know are cross-trained across all these different fields uh, because things are becoming so very much specialized to get more out of the transistors that we have. Yeah, great point. Good for the students too, I think. But yeah, a lot more demanding than when we were all uh, in school. Uh, that's for sure. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about tech transfer. So maybe coming back to Ritu, since you've had some experience in Microsoft and Intel, um, why don't you tell us how you think, uh, or what, what place you think companies, uh, what role, I should say, you think companies fill uh, in this ecosystem as investors, as innovators themselves, as acquirers? Um, maybe just talk about your experience there. Yeah, I think, um, so they, they play all these different roles, right? So for instance, um, as you're talking, Intel does have a venture capital group as well as it has very advanced um, research and uh, development groups. Um, where I think uh, they play a, uh, they can play two good roles. One is to build an open source hardware ecosystem. Like for instance, NVIDIA released its NVIDIA uh, sort of um, accelerator, the, the whole system stack, and that was very useful for the community. Like we have to build, uh, we, don't, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. One of the big problems in building these systems, which David was talking about, is that how do, if you have to start from scratch, for academics to start inventing, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's an enormous amount of work. So if uh, the big companies sort of pitch in and help us out with open source frameworks, that can be very useful. 
and I see that uh, trend happening in um, our community a lot. Even academics are pitching in to build these jump start kits for hardware. Um, and in terms of um, uh, investment, I think um, they they are also like sort of partnering up with these startups, and I see that happening a lot. Like it's it's it, it could go to an acquisition, but it sort of partnering up and sort of steering them a little bit towards the right problems, and that's very useful too. Um, Microsoft Research is a whole story in itself because it's, it's completely dedicated to research. So there the lessons you learn is like how in long term your research can actually go to something which is useful. So uh, that's, uh, that's the story there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so perhaps bring it back regionally. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard a bit about startups here that have started in Ann Arbor and then moved on. Moved to Austin or uh, moved to the West Coast, moved to a different location. Mm -hmm. uh, question for Dennis. Um, since some of the more recent um, startups are now staying put uh, in Ann Arbor. So what do you see, um, or do you notice any changes there? Is there a reason why um, all of a sudden startups are now staying local? Uh, and how do we keep more startups local? Um, so I'll try to answer that, although you may be better to answer it than I am. So, uh, because two of my three are gone. So um, the reason Ambic moved and the reason Mythic moved uh, really was because they had a um, aggressive growth strategy, right? And so, you know, if you want to go up to 80 employees or 100 employees in the near term, relatively near term, it's very difficult to find that sort of, you know, manpower, so to speak, in Ann Arbor. At least it was, you know, in the days when they were uh, considering whether to move or not. And definitely, it doesn't always go over way, very well. Last night at the dinner I was at, I mentioned that there was an Ann Arbor news article or online article about when Ambic moved and people were very unhappy and lots of angry commenters with pitchforks uh, about the use of university and state resources and then moving it out of state. Um, but, uh, so recently, CubeWorks, you know, which is an organic, you know, sort of slower growth, really take your time. Uh, and Movellus, which is, is more intermediate, it's, it's actually a, your company, uh, which is a sizable company, but has a really, you know, decent, uh, most of their presence here in Ann Arbor. There are definitely more and more examples of people staying here. So I think that, uh, and then, you know, Crossbar, uh, Waze Company is another one of those very rapid growth companies, bringing a lot of money rapidly, and then you want to hire. So there's different strategies and different types of companies, and I think that the preference is to stay here, especially if the students and the, and the faculty stay very involved. So if the faculty wants to stay involved, like you have with Movellus, like David has with QWorks in particular, it makes sense to have that, you know, gravity holding it here. And um, and I think there's a trend toward even with the larger companies like Everactive, your, your other company, where they'll have a satellite office here of a decent size, and then you get the, 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 the mind share from that. So, so I think there's different avenues to take, and I think that uh, the, you know, the more companies that start here, the more companies that stay here is going to have a positive feedback effect. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, okay, so time, quick time check, we got about 10 minutes. So I want to turn it over. Uh, now, now's the time, now it's your job. You have to ask some questions. So you've had some time to think about it. You've heard some comments from the panelists. So who wants to be brave and go first? Otherwise, I will just cold call. <laughs> Another common strategy used by professors is you just wait. There's always a question. Someone's got a question, you just wait. Maybe <laughs> yeah. In the post-CMOS world, where do you place quantum computing? <laughs> and what are the tech transfer and startup opportunities there? <laughs> okay, I'll be brave. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, that's a great question. So um, there are some companies that really believe in quantum uh, computing. Uh, there are some that don't believe in quantum computing. So that's a hotly debated topic. So for example, one company, I can name names because they, they came out, they actually mentioned this publicly, they don't believe in quantum computing, that's HP. So HP, uh, it doesn't believe in quantum computing for general com computer. Uh, it can be used for uh, communication or encryption or decoding these kind of things. But for general computing, they don't believe that's really, um, because quantum computing, there's a lot of infrastructure you need to set up. You need low temperature, you need have the qubits working properly, uh, then you need to transfer the quantum information back to classical in information. So, uh, so they, they feel there are a lot of opportunities um, that 
are there for quantum computing, right? I mean, um, it, it's very fast. Uh, it's it's highly, uh, yeah, parallel, so it's very extremely efficient and uh, for certain tasks. But uh, the question is, do you need quantum computer for everybody or every company, right? So if they are trying to become like a um, service company for enterprise, uh, so um, so they don't believe that most of the enterprises they may need they need a quantum computer. So uh, for 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 government, for some special applications, um, it may be very good. Again, this is a, uh, this is a, I'm trying I'm saying what they uh, wanted to say in one of their white papers. Uh, so that's uh, that's one example. But obviously, there are other people who strongly believe in quantum computing. Um, uh, there are some arguments like uh, all computing we use today is some sort of quantum computing. There's just a, there's I mean you can stretch it that way. Uh, but uh, but it's very interesting topic. So yeah. So I, I don't know if you have the right answer or wrong answer, because that's yeah, that's what very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. I think uh, the only thing maybe to add is that uh, it takes tremendous infrastructure to do quantum computing. Yeah. So it's really not a startup uh, kind of play. Uh, and there are some very very large companies, IBM, Intel, that are investing, and Google investing yeah. tremendously in it. But if you look at it, they're only betting a very, very small percentage of their company on it. So, um, so no one is really making a huge bet on it. L slightly less diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Dave. Thinking about autonomous vehicles and AI, machine learning, are there some things some of you are doing that make those intersect or you see how how we are doing is going to intersect to make that autonomous vehicle possible? So the question was around autonomous vehicles and what are the things that either the panel is doing or that the panel panelists have observed that um, intersects machine learning and autonomous vehicles to help enable that. Okay. Sure I can I can take that. Um, I think machine learning is the heart and soul of autonomous vehicles. That's how I think of it. Because uh, one of the main tasks which autonomous vehicles need to do is perception, like when, and that too in a completely automated manner. So you know we need both accurate machine learning models and efficient hardware, which can crunch all that video, um, all that you know, a lot of sensor data and image data uh, quickly and accurately. So. Um, so hardware startups can play a huge role right there by building custom systems um, for autonomous cars. Um, that's there's lots of research going on in that space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I can add just a little bit. I mean, in the research domain. So you know, David and I, with another collaborator, have been working on computer vision algorithms and machine learning and so on and so forth, mainly for small scale, so not for full-on autonomous self-driving car type things, more for robotics on a small scale, things like that. Um, you know, I think there's a couple companies that a lot of people in the audience probably know better than I do coming out of Michigan that have at least a somewhat relevance to this, right? So, you know, Jason Corso in our department is a computer vision specialist and he has a startup company and I don't know the exact nature of what he's doing there. Uh, and then May Mobility out of CSE is, is an autonomous vehicle yeah. company out of uh, Ed Olson's group. Uh, so there's, there's there's several companies there that are definitely touching on this. Um, you know, my personal opinion is that truly self-driving cars are, you know, many 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 years away, uh, nowhere near. Uh, you know, you know. So I think the rumors of their arrival are greatly exaggerated. Um, so I think that it's great for research. Um, and I have a friend in uh, Berkeley who just had his startup acquired by Tesla in this space. Um, and so you know, certainly it can be a lucrative uh, field to go into. But uh, if you, you know. So I think that right now we're, we're focusing on the smaller scale than, than the big vehicles. That said, M-City does have a driverless shuttle. Right <laughs> around <our campus. laughs> Just don't get in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> it will be bad. <laughs> we have a few more minutes. We'll take another question. All right. Oh, question. Yeah. Why are you calling it post CMOS? Why are we calling it post CMOS? Is the question. Um, I don't think I titled the uh, panel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> um, 
Well, you know, I think that's a good question because a lot of what we're going to be doing is is not really post CMOS, right? So Wei had a, a nice discussion of the different approaches to post CMOS. He talked about 3D stacking, he talked about computed memory, but those are still based on a CMOS platform. Mm -hmm. So unless you're fundamentally changing the switch from a MOSFET uh, to something else, um, then you know you could argue that that's not really truly post CMOS. Now Way's companies and Way's technology is largely on a resistive RAM and using that for compute. And so when you embed that into a CMOS chip or, or very closely with, I would argue that, that you could say that's post CMOS because you're doing compute with novel new memory devices, um, but you're still fundamentally using CMOS. And I think that's a really important point is that let's say three nanometers or two if you're lucky ends up being the final CMOS node. That node is going to be used for many, many, many years. Okay, it's you know, and, and then David's points come to light, which is that the designers then and the architects have to basically figure out how to use the same te technology, the same transistors, you know, as they did 10 years ago, but use them in more intelligent ways. So I think the burden you know, can shift a little bit. Meanwhile, in the background, all the all the device engineers and researchers are going to be working as hard as they possibly can to figure out what that next switch is going to be. But it's clearly clearly a very challenging problem, and no one knows the answer to that. Yeah, I think I think it is historically uh, part of the reason is because we thought there was going to be a non-CMOS switch, uh, and that really hasn't materialized. Uh, now Wei Lu and his work has shown a post-CMOS memory element, and that's partly why now compute is also moving into memory. Uh, but the switch hasn't really switched from CMOS. But there were many candidates, um, and none of those have worked out, and so there was this expectation that. Right, that would be that, and, but we still still call it post CMOS. Maybe I'll uh, yeah. Add, maybe uh, <laughs> maybe it's yeah. It's not technically post CMOS, but uh, people are looking beyond conventional materials. Uh, conventional, uh, for example, in the past it's just silicon and silicon oxide, but now people are looking at every element on the uh, periodic table. So in this <laughs> sense, you can say it's not conventional CMOS. It's a still yes. It's it post silicon yes. So it's still the same uh, device structure, but you are looking much broader material side. You are looking heterogeneous integration, this type of things. So it's not just simply scaling CMOS, but uh, uh, different man side. Yeah, and I would just add that although the materials is not post CMOS, that trend is pushing us to think beyond it, mm -hmm. in all across the stack. So you know, it's still not happened, as they all said, but the fear of that happening is making us drive towards all this innovation. Great, well we are at the end of our time. So thank you for all the questions. I want to thank the panelists again as well. <laughs> and we'll all be here hanging out uh, for a bit after if you want to chat one on one. Thank you. Good job, David.
experience in this panel about how far we've come as an entrepreneurial ecosystem but we also want to talk about current state we want to talk about some of the opportunities the challenges and things we're excited about things we need to work on and so uh, I have an esteemed uh, panel here I have Alec Gallimore uh, go blue uh, <laughs> Dean of uh, my alma mater the College of Engineering here at the University of Michigan we're delighted to have you here, Alec. Uh, my good friend, Bill Brinkerhoff, who I often end up running 5Ks and occasional 10K with and hang out at Argus Farm Stop with him every now and then, uh, but uh, uh, serial entrepreneur. And they'll each tell their own stories. Uh, Patty Glaza down at uh, Invest Detroit, and Doug Neal, who cohabitates with us at Menlo in the Ann Arbor Startup Garage as uh, one of the managing partners of ELAP Ventures. So what I'd like to do is have each of them tell just a little bit of their life story so you have some context as to what their, um, uh, what their input in around the discussion is here. And it'll also give you a chance to think of some questions you might want to ask later on in the panel discussion. So Alec, let's start with you first. Thank you. Oh good, you can hear me. Um, so I have to admit I'm a recovering entrepreneur. Uh, and I mean that by, uh, I started a company back in 1999, and in those dark days for the University of Michigan, um, the university was quite hostile towards entrepreneurs, as a matter of fact. I tell the story, and I'll be very brief about that, where I was at a meeting in the Fleming Building, which is our lead administration building, with a number of people, and I literally had a pledge allegiance to the University of Michigan because people thought that it was suspicious that a faculty member would want to start a company because why would you want to do that? Um, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that except to say that I have been amazed at how much of the culture we have now is entrepreneurship. As a matter of fact, Princeton Review just uh, released the number one ranking for the University of Michigan as the number one educator of entrepreneurs and that's a campus-wide ranking. And so, the fact that the University of Michigan writ large across the entire university has embraced entrepreneurship in not 20 years, but probably more like 10 or 15 years, maybe 10 or 12 years, is heartening. Uh, now, as we do promotion and tenure, it's something we ask about, not only just technology transfer, but entrepreneurship. And now we have assistant professors, so pre-tenure faculty members, who are asking for leaves of absence to, to do startup companies. So it's just been marvelous. I'll spend more time later on talking a little bit about elements going on now in terms of what we're doing on the educational front, but also what we're trying to do to stimulate the ecosystem in terms of not only startups, but attracting large companies here as well. But I'll stop at that. So my name is Bill Brinkerhoff. Um, Rich asked us to go through a little bit of our background. I'll say I'm from Ann Arbor, uh, went to school here, and have uh, three degrees uh, from Michigan in engineering and, and business. Uh, we moved to the East Coast and worked for, I worked for big pharmaceutical companies out there. And then about 12 years in and three kids in, um, living in New Jersey and you know having a commute, really liking life out there, we decided to just move back to our alma mater. Uh, we had aging parents. We wanted to become part of this community. And so we just transitioned. And, um, and I say that that was in 2001. 
if, um, and I was trying to transition an industrial career, you know, to a, a career in Ann Arbor and had those exploratory talks about, you know, what can someone who's got, you know, some marketing and sales and licensing experience do in Ann Arbor and talk to the University of Michigan, I talked to venture capitalists, and it was, you know, it was a little bit, um, a little bit challenging. There wasn't like this big pathway for in, people with industry experience to come back in 2001. Um, one of the companies that we've been keeping a track of at, at my pharmaceutical company was Asperion Therapeutics, and so I ended up joining them, um, and then did uh, a second after that company was sold to Pfizer, uh, did a, a, a second company also in HDL cholesterol, and then a third company also in HDL cholesterol. And currently I'm working on uh, kind of a HDL company called Evo Therapeutics, looking at vaccine applications um, that, uh, where the vaccine can be delivered by, by HDL cholesterol. Um, I, and I guess I can contrast that early days uh, of the ecosystem, um, that it was a little bit difficult and it took a couple of years to transition someone who really wanted to be back in this community um, to today, you know, as we go out and try to bring people into our, our companies, um, it's, a, it's a much easier sell, and working with Tech Transfer also is a, uh, uh, is a, is a great experience. The team is, is ready and engaged and, and, and ready to work with you. So, um, so I think that's my bad. I'll pass it over here. Hello, everyone. I'm Patty Glaza, and I'm with Invest Detroit Ventures. So my career started off very boring. I was with Accenture for over six years, but it did lay a very good foundation in IT and systems integration and Fortune 500 that has certainly led to where I am today. So I got launched into the startup ecosystem when I had my first uh, internship analyst position with Chris Reisick and Governor Rick Snyder at their first fund, Avalon Investments. So I went, yeah, learned to go through a stack of pitch decks, um, business plans, and really try to start to understand what was happening. So I had a really good vision of who was investing and uh, what types of companies were being invested back, oh, well, over about 20 years ago. So though moving from Avalon, I started with um, uh, uh, health media, so certainly one of Vic's uh, Professor Vic Strucker's uh, first company. So that was a great lesson in um, learning how to ride the, you know, to the 9-11 uh, and when funding decreases on their big market events that happen outside of your control. Uh, then was brought in to help run Small Times Media uh, information services around nanotech and MEMS, um, again for uh, Chris and Rick. That company, um, I later sold, was CEO, sold it to another company, went through a transition and um, the whole acquisition process and team. Then was crazy enough to start my own organization with some friends in the nanotech space that was focused on clean tech. Did that for a few years. And I think that experience, so from being a part of a startup, running a startup, and then founding a startup, I was really looking for something that I could help other folks not make the same mistakes or just make their lives easier. So I went back into venture in 2011. I worked for a national fund um, out of Florida and came to Invest Detroit about uh, five years ago. So we're a seed fund. I'm funding 20 to 25 companies a year, but really trying to help use my experience and background and my network to help make everyone's lives just a little bit simpler. Well, good afternoon. Uh, Doug Neal with Eli Ventures. Let's see. Um, it's always therapeutic when, when you. There, it's good for you to go through this, I think. I don't think there's a recovery for entrepreneurs. <laughs> so I, I consistently you know, entrepreneurial mode. Uh, I went to Central Michigan University, computer science. Wanted to get out of Michigan as fast as I could so I can relate to students who want to leave Michigan and they desire to go see the world. And I actually don't think you should stop that. I think you need to find ways to bring it back which I, I came back. Um, went on to work for Hewlett Packard and then went to Peter Norton, the semantic group, worked on Norton Utilities, Norton Antivirus, and you better remember those products, Norton Utilities, Norton Speed Disk, things like that. Um, and uh, when it started, uh, became a director of engineering there for a networking product, left that to start my own company, a venture back mobile security company. Back then, that was Windows 95 and Palm Pilot. That was the <laughs> 
And so uh, uh, that was a venture back company. I was CEO, grew that. Um, try to raise money. For people who complain about raising money in tough times, try raising money during the dot-com bust. That was <laughs> tough. We had to do something very creative to get um, uh, cash in the door. We had to sell product in order to get revenue, which is not how it was. So we had to raise money. And so I uh, sold that company in 2004. My wife and I had three native California daughters at that point. We wanted to move back to the Midwest. So I Googled entrepreneurship, Michigan, and the MVCA came to the top of the list. And so I reached out to the Michigan Venture Capital Association and said, we take a you know, single member. And they said, yeah, we have an individual membership fee. And so that's how I first got connected to the Michigan entrepreneurial uh, scene from Los Angeles. Uh, moved back, worked on another startup that crashed and burned. Met Bill Mayers, Bill here from Spark. And uh, he was one of the first people I met. He kept a shirt from that company in his office, the most expensive shirt I ever made. <laughs> <laughs> um, he pulls it out to scare me once in a while. Uh, and then from that, he was recruited to run the Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan in Engineering School. That was a great experience. I always found surrounding myself with people smarter than me is always a great decision to make in life. So I did that for a few years. Was going to start another tech company in 2012, and instead I started Elab Ventures because I saw so much potential in the ecosystem and thought we could do more good and uh, have a great time by investing in lots of companies as opposed, opposed to even just one company. So Elab Ventures is an early stage seed uh, venture capital fund with offices in Ann Arbor and Silicon Valley. We've done about 18 companies and about a third of our companies are spin outs from the University of Michigan. Awesome. Well, great to have you all here. Thanks for uh, thanks for agreeing to be part of this panel discussion. Um, I want to start with kind of a basic uh, foundational piece. Uh, Alec, I think you moved from somewhere to come here. Yeah. Uh, but everybody else lived in this area, maybe left and then came back. Uh, and I grew up in, uh, in Mount Clemens, came to school here, fell in love with Ann Arbor. I graduated with two degrees in computer science, computer engineering. 1982. I could have gone anywhere in the country and had offers from all around the country, but I chose to stay here. And I'm just curious, why Ann Arbor? What, what is it about this town that attracts all of you? All right, I'll jump in first. Um, so at many points in my career that I've had been asked to stay where I was. Um, first was Atlanta, um, and then Kentucky, Florida, um, Austin, Texas, Boston. And I've always chose Michigan uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I am a born Michiganian, Michigander, whichever side you sit on, <laughs> from point you're on. Uh, but I love the culture of the state. I think it's a beautiful place. Um, the, from anywhere you go in the state, the outdoor activities, the the culture of the people, they're hardworking, they care about each other, it's a community. And when I thought about where I wanted to have my family, and I have two teenage girls, um, this place felt like the right place to, and the right values in which I wanted to raise my kids. Now again, I'm from here, so I'm really super biased. Um, but all the other places, and Austin was a place where I launched uh, my, uh, company, first company that I helped found, and it was great, it was fantastic, all the young people, and the, reminded me very much of Ann Arbor, actually. Um, but at the end of the day, this is the place I love and the people I care about helping and being a part of that community. Yeah, I'll say, you know, we live 12 miles from Manhattan, and we were lucky if we got in there like once every three months, so it, it's a great place to be. But to be back in Ann Arbor with the culture and things that we have here is, is, is unparalleled. Um, I'll also just say, like, if you're thinking about your career and you want to have part of your life be focused on community type activities, you know, it's tougher to do when you're commuting like an hour each way to work and you just have the overhead of a, a, a pretty attractive coastal experience. It's just you don't quite have enough time to do some other things. So I think it's been uh, helpful here, not only for our three kids, but for us to be involved in other things. I'll be, I'll be brief as well, but um, uh, as Rich mentioned, I came from uh, somewhere else. I, was a, I came from Princeton University, where I was a PhD student in aerospace engineering. And I came here thinking I'd be here for a few years and then become an astronaut. 
and <laughs> not an <laughs> astronaut yet. <laughs> but, but the point, the thing that's kept me here is, is both the Ann Arbor and the state of Michigan, as well as the University of Michigan. I'll talk about what it is that's attractive about the University of Michigan very briefly to me, which is, so I've been on the faculty now my 28th year, and I went back to my one of my alum uh, reunions at Princeton University, and we talked to the people there, and I said, why are, you, why are you proud of being an alum of Princeton University? What is it that Princeton has done for society? Because I can tell you what the University of Michigan has done, not the least of which is that we opened our doors to women to be students here 100 years before the Ivies did. We were the place where African Americans learned how to become physicians, how to become engineers, physicists, decades before our private universities. And that public university ethos is something that I think is really amazing about the university. It's something that's kept me here on the faculty almost 30 years. All right. So um, we're here to talk about the ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem of Ann Arbor uh, in our region. And, you know, when anybody talks about ecosystem, you kind of hear three hot topics around talent. Uh, and that talent can be the talent we need to build our firms, but also the talent we have to lead our firms. And the talent we have to mentor people around us, uh, access to capital and access to ideas. Where else do we go from here in terms of what do we have in our ecosystem, what do we need in our ecosystem? Um, I have, I stated in our setup phone call that I thought the economic spotlight of the nation has uh, pivoted to major research universities. Um, uh, and I think what we'll talk about is why would that happen? Why would the economic centers now center around Cambridge, Ann Arbor, Austin, Boulder, Palo Alto, as opposed to where they traditionally have over the years on the very large cities? And uh, Alec, I'm going to have you start because I thought you had some really interesting thoughts on this. So, um, you know, when you think about how uh, technology is being developed, um, you can think of it in, in sort of a few buckets. One, of course, are large corporate entities the, who are doing it for shareholder value. The other, of course, are startup companies. And often the realm of the startup company is that entrepreneurs have an idea, and more and more, many of those entrepreneurs are largely coming from the ranks of major research universities. And the reason why that's in, in, incredibly important is because what corporate entities are looking for is disruptive technology. They're looking for technology that can advance their own missions, but they're often also looking for technologies that could bury them if they're not adroit enough to be able to take advantage of that. And so if you talk to chief technology officers, and, and my advisory board, I have a number of chief, chief technology officers, officers. They spend a lot of time pouring through pitch book because of what they're looking for are those new innovations that are being generated that could help their business or otherwise hurt their business. And when you think of where the seeds of innovation is in our society by and large, it's hard to argue that universities, especially major universities, isn't front and center in that for a number of reasons. A, it's still able to attract the most amazing talent from across the world which is under assault, but it, up to now we're able to, to bring the brightest and the best from all over the world. Also, the environment in higher ed allows our faculty, students, and staff to really try things without having to worry about the next quarter or what the reports are on the street. And it's not an either or things. It's important to have these large corporate entities. It's large to have this entrepreneurial mindset as well. But as a quick example, when you look at the Olympics next year, in Tokyo, you'll see Toyota will unveil their self-driving car. That self-driving car was developed here in Ann Arbor because Toyota created the Toyota Research Institute because they wanted the synergy that allows the very best and the brightest from the university to work with the very best and the brightest from industry and do a, develop a product that you could never do with either of those two entities. Doug, I'm just curious, uh, when you came back to, obviously you went to the Center for Entrepreneurship first, but then you got together with your fellow partners and decided to start a venture capital fund, and uh, not that we don't have any venture capital funds here, but you probably had with, I know your three other partners are out in San Francisco. Uh, was there a tug of war there as to where you would start that fund, or was it 
determined that Ann Arbor was going to be an epicenter for that fund, and why? Yeah. Yeah, so it was determined from the beginning. The design was that uh, Ann Arbor would almost be the headquarters of the fund um, because there's a lot of venture capital chasing a lot of deals in Silicon Valley. Um, but the you know we had uh, 27 venture funds in Michigan now, um, but the deal flow, the, the amount of startups are rising faster than the number of venture capital funds. Um, uh, in terms of what we need, we need more of everything, right? Of all these things. But we thought, uh, with our experience being entrepreneurs and operators, that we could um, bring our connections to Silicon Valley and early stage customers and syndicate venture capital partners uh, for follow on investing to early stage companies in the Midwest as kind of a unique model, uh, which, we, which was from the beginning of the design. Um, we uh, thought that there is a lot of good engineering and scientific talent here, which there is. Um, and companies are voting with their feet. KLA 10 Core is moving basically their headquarters here. Um, we're seeing a lot of companies who have abandoned basic research now kind of latching on to research institutions in the country, leading ones like uh, Michigan's, uh, to be close to that talent. Uh, but we need more experienced product managers, more experienced um, business executives, uh, VP of sales, VP of marketing in the ecosystem to complement the high density we have an engineering talent. So it's a long answer to your question, but by design, we saw an opportunity that there is a lot more exciting things happening outside of Silicon Valley um, that you can actually uh, do a lot, of, a lot of exciting things with. And as I recall, you wanted to bring Silicon Valley money, maybe with some Michigan connections to it back here to Ann Arbor because there was capital efficiency as well in our region compared to the West Coast. How has that gone? Well, how has that been received? If somebody comes back to Ann Arbor, how are they? Uh, what doubts do they have when they walk in, and what 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 does their mind look like after they leave a visit with you? Yeah, I'm smiling because we have two of our thesis were that um, uh, one was you attract Silicon Valley money back to Michigan. Another was you already alluded to it: the uh, efficiencies of pricing and building companies here is. Uh, very good. So, in general, the rule of thumb has been before everybody got into machine learning, which has driven prices up for startups, um, the uh, price of a company is about half that of investing in Silicon Valley, and it's about half as expensive to build companies in Michigan as it is to build the Silicon Valley. So, that's proven out to be pretty much true. Um, getting Silicon Valley individuals to invest in uh, venture funds in Michigan is very difficult to do because people in Silicon Valley believe. If it doesn't happen in Silicon Valley, it doesn't happen. So there's a very uh, inward focus. Now that said, what we're seeing is it's changing in that Series B, Series C investors are now investing capital in Michigan. We saw that with some of the large exits recently. So that's happening. And some small checks being placed um, uh, by West Coast ones as well. Patty, what's your perspective on this from Invest Detroit? What is, where does Invest Detroit focus their attention? So agree with a lot of the comments uh, Doug was making. So Invest Detroit, so even though our name says Invest Detroit, we do focus on the state of Michigan. So teams starting up everywhere, not just out of the universities, but uh, across the state. I would really want to double down on the point Doug was making about the non-technical talent. So every day I see just such incredible technology projects, <laughs> right, that have really great potential, but don't have the full founding team that can really drive that in terms of execution and speed to market. And so if I had a magic wand, so right now I can write checks, um, usually I write checks of about 100 to 125, and then I can follow on up to about uh, 250. Um, and can slightly larger with my older uh, later stage fund, but still, that's not a big enough check. If I had my magic wand, I'd put 250 for operations and I'd put 250 to capital or for talent. And that talent is the senior executives, it's marketing, it's sales, 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 sales. I wish I could just plug a few people <laughs> from around the country and bring them here. Um, it's just that we build it and they will come, has to shift. Uh, because we have so much innovation, and if we don't build the right teams fast enough, 
And they're a great program. So the University of Michigan's Mentor in Residence program has been incredible for a lot of the companies who are spinning out of the University of Michigan. And there are um, other programs around the state. Um, Spark does a good job with this. Tech Town, um, uh, Michigan State. They're also trying to put seasoned folks around these teams, but it isn't enough. And it isn't just a mentor, it's real folks who are on the team. So if my magic wand is sort of the non-technical talent, if we compare that with our technical talent here, we'd even be growing that much faster. Bill, you've probably been faced with building your teams and seeking and finding that talent. My guess is you were also one of the usual suspects uh, when people are looking for building a team with senior talent, they're probably looking for people just like you, or maybe exactly you, uh, what have you seen on the talent front that's either been helpful or hurtful for what you're going? Yeah, I, so hey, I'll echo uh, Patty's comments on you know bringing in the team besides the technical part, and I'll pause on the technical part because I think the genius and the invention coming out of this area is unparalleled. If you could go toe to toe with Stanford, MIT, the, you know, the breakthrough ideas are here. Um, and when you start to look at the metrics between how fast that uh, technology can um, be transitioned to market, you know, that's where you see the difference in Ann Arbor compared to some of the other areas. And so, um, and a lot of that is the, is the filling out of the management teams. Um, the, uh, uh, when we've had to build out our teams, it's, there's interest in Ann Arbor, um, but it's a matter of building critical mass and having multiple companies here. And I think the success track record that's happening is starting to loosen the venture capital reigns a little bit, as you've seen that there have been successful exits, uh, money flows more a little bit easily here. Um, and you know, I remember when we formed Serenus Therapeutics, um, we were raising a $30 million Series A, and uh, as a company co-headquartered in Ann Arbor and Toulouse, France, and we had investors from Europe and the US, and they wanted us to be anywhere but Ann Arbor. They wanted us to be in New York or Boston or Paris. Um, but we really fought back and uh, just made the point um, that the milestones are set out in front of us. Um, we can achieve these based where we are now, which, which was in these two headquarters. Um, and if we're not achieving our milestones, you know, we can talk about you know, where to relocate. But why would you uproot a team uh, and move, um, to incur nine months of delay right at startup um, just out of convenience? So, yeah. Awesome. You know, I know. Uh, Alec, you had mentioned as well that having big companies in the area is actually really advantageous to an entrepreneurial ecosystem, and I couldn't agree more. When we started Menlo in 2001, our first customers were Pfizer, Domino's Pizza, um, ProQuest, uh, the University of Michigan Health System. Uh, we probably wouldn't be alive today as a company were it not for those big companies in our region. Uh, and I know you were recently very involved in getting KLA to come here. Could you talk a little bit about uh, sort of your interest in recruiting a company like that? And how does that work? Where, where did that all come from? Sure. Um, you know, part of it is what we're talking about is the uh, non-technical talent, for sure. But um, a big drive in this is um, when we bring these large companies in, again, for what I mentioned before, the reason for they're looking for new technology, disruptive technology, what they're doing is they're forming these strong partnerships often with universities. And our technology transfer and business engagement center, and we'll shout out to BNC, what we've been able to do and work very well with is that we have these very well-funded alliances with Ford, Toyota, et cetera, and we're starting to build that kind of capacity, I think, with KLA. And what you find is that our researchers who are working in these major projects with these companies are able to then spin off their own startup companies. And they do it with uh, agreements sometimes with the large companies, but they also do it in many cases in markets that are orthogonal to the large companies, but essentially complement the area. And so with the KLA uh, move here, for example, and to give you a background, KLA develops amazing technology for inspection of wafers that make chips. I mean, amazing technologies. And one of the reasons why they came here is they wanted access to our diverse, technical talent that we have here in the College of Engineering, and they want to apply advanced uh, machine learning and visualization techniques to improve what they're trying to do. Now, sure, what's going to happen is that KLA is going to fund some research and work with our faculty members, 
But there's no doubt in my mind what will happen also is that some of those researchers will develop startup companies as well. And then as we, uh, and, and those startup companies will thrive. And as we sort of bootstrap by bringing large companies in that builds these startup companies, I think that will help attract the kind of talent that I couldn't agree more with my colleagues here is that's actually, if you will, sort of the bottleneck uh, to Ann Arbor. And I won't go into the details, but if you think about the success of Duo, Duo would not be here if it hadn't been for Arbor Networks first. Yeah, and I, it, it, I look all the way back in my own uh, career here in Ann Arbor. I started out at a company uh, in Plymouth Road called Manufacturing Data Systems Incorporated. Uh, and it was, um, it's, it's now Arbor Lakes. It's right at the turn into, uh, it's a company with the gerbil tubes between the buildings. Uh, and um, uh, awesome company, probably one of the greatest entrepreneurial success stories in Ann Arbor history, uh, but eventually sold, uh, uh, sold and uh, as often happens after a sale, uh, there can be a meltdown later. Uh, but you can trace so many companies in Ann Arbor today that came out of Sitecor and Irwin Magnetic Systems and MDSI and uh, so many others around town. So we have to also recognize that sometimes what looks like a negative event, even like the dot-com bubble burst, uh, leads to success uh, later. I can tell you having you know, sort of along the lines of Doug's story with uh, 2001, we formed Menlo uh, because I lost my job and chose entrepreneurship over unemployment. And uh, <laughs> it's an easy choice. Um, but, uh, but, you know, chairs were $5 each, tables were $10 each, people would, were willing to work for free if, uh, if that was legal. Um, space was inexpensive, computers were inexpensive, so it's often a, a downturn is a great time to start a business. And so, um, you know, there's kind of a sale on everything at that point. Um, I'd be curious to uh, hear um, from you on what do you think are some of the most exciting developments in the last decade to increase the strength of our ecosystem? And Patty, I'm going to start with you because you and I are both connected to a little clubhouse, as I used to call it, uh, that, um, uh, that we were part of way back in uh, the uh, late 90s and early 2000s called the IT Zone. And where did you see that go from there? Yeah, so fun fact, I was the intern that wrote the first business plan for the Ann Arbor IT Zone. Um, so, so way back when, uh, I, I think the things that have excited me the most to in, kind of in line with this conversation is the infrastructure that's been built up around the needs of the community. So Spark being such a critical catalyst in terms of space for our, um, for our companies, for programs, for finding, you know, being the smart zone that hands out checks and helps connect people. And that community, smaller community within a community really helps to drive the interactions that are necessary because it is relationships. Relationships drive so many of the startups, and whether it's capital relationships, whether it's finding someone to come work for you, whether that's it, someone for your advisory board or your board, right? So these relationships are so critical to the success of growing the ecosystem. So watching Spark, then watching other groups come online, watching, so Tech Town, what's going on at Michigan State with the Conquer program or the Hatch, you, know, you have then these accelerator programs that have come into the state and from early, early stage, you know, Startup Boost and Spark Boot Camp to later stage programs such as Desai and Techstars. These, this kind of putting the, that programmatic focus, hey, we're going to step back, we're going to focus on strategy, we're going to make sure you have you know, a business model that makes sense and you're connected to people that will help you. And so watching this growth, and obviously there are some programs that have been wildly successful, some programs that had their time in place, but overall, the watching the number grow and the impact grow all feeds on itself. And watching folks who have had successful exits start to come back into the ecosystem with either 
their second, third company, or with being an angel investor or starting a fund. These are all things that create this you know, momentum, which I think we are at such a momentum from where I was or watching Ann Arbor in this area 20 years ago. And from the point of Detroit, I think we're probably 15 years behind, but we're, they, you know, we're on that track as well in terms of you know, how, the number of companies, the people who are attracted to want to work there. Um, but we are a little behind, but I see Ann Arbor has just been on an incredible upward trend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll just call it one um, thing that really made a big difference probably 10 years ago uh, was a decision that was criticized at the time when the university acquired the Pfizer space, you know, took this off of the tax rolls. And, you know, there's lots of reasons to think that that might not be like the best idea. Um, and and, and it, I guess if you can remember that that site for Pfizer before that with Park Davis was the spot of innovation. You know, that's where Lipitor was invented, where Acupril, where Neurontin. You know, it was a beautiful place of invention that led to lots of blockbuster drugs. And if you look at the exact same space now, as it's been kind of transformed by, by Tech Transfer Venture Accelerator, I see you know, you know, Ken and Kelly both in the room. Um, it is, you know, comparatively now, it's not housed, you know, housing one big company, but it's housing lots of startup energy. Um, and I think that as a uh, transition, you know, that decision, uh, it, had it not been made, we would have had a totally different environment here. It's wonderful to have that kind of uh, infrastructure for startups. Yeah, I think that um, collaboration is key, as we've seen. Uh, if you look at Ann Arbor Spark as a collaboration between the city, the county, the university, and the business community, it's a it, it's a recognition, I think, by a lot of entities in our community that this is this is a big deal. We need to work on this together. That no one of us alone can do this. I can recall in the early days that the University of Michigan itself felt like this big monolithic structure that there were no doors in on the bottom. You didn't know how to get inside. I had kind of two Ann Arbor lives where I, I was a student inside the university and once I graduated there wasn't much contact back either in a business or as an entrepreneur. Now what I see is um, it's hard to tell where the university ends and, and the business community begins. Uh, and it's been interesting to watch that um, the porousness of the interface and, uh, you know, Doug, you were both inside the university in the CFE and now outside in, um, uh, in uh, a venture capital firm. I'm just curious uh, between you and Alec, what are your thoughts on the changing landscape inside the University of Michigan in terms of collaboration outside the university in the local region? Yeah, it's, it has changed a lot. I, mean, I, I try to, there's not just one thing I put my finger on that I would say this is the reason, as Patty went through a list of a lot of the things that have happened in the ecosystem. Um, I do think uh, the more we would have, when I was at the CV, the more we'd have alumni come in and speak to students, bringing researchers out to uh, engage companies, the more we would do different things like that and just keep the door, people going through the door both ways, create more opportunities for collisions of ideas and people. And uh, those are all very successful. I think the i if I can point to that program for a little bit, I'm not sure how many people know about i which is the innovation core, like the Peace Corps for innovators. That U of M was part of the foundation of that, when it was started at Stanford, and then we're now one of the foundational hubs of that, was, I think, a really good catalyst to get researchers paired with mentors and a student or a postdoc to go out and take something out of the lab and go see what the world thinks about it. And I remember some of those great experiences early on where the researchers would come to me and say, I haven't been out, I haven't talked to any customers about my research. Um, I've been working on this 20 years. And it's, it's not another life board, it's kind of a boot camp for entrepreneurs and researchers. It's forced simulated stress of building a company. And we made them go talk to 100 customers in six weeks. And a lot of them have told me it's transformation and how they think about it. How did they go at first? Give us some anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> and I both were the instructors in that. There are a lot of, um, it, it's pretty brutal. The very first day, the very first, they all have to get up and present. And they, we don't let them get more than two minutes into the presentation before we interrupt them and cut them off and start berating them on what they're doing wrong. <laughs> and uh, sometimes four minutes maybe, if we're nice. 
Um, but it, we're trying to make sure we're, it's not it's not a um, cuddly kind of feeling opportunity. It's a forced simulation of the pressure and stress to go from uh, uh, go to entrepreneur speed because you have to move fast and time is everything. And it doesn't matter what you really think about your idea. Is go talk to people who may want to buy it or care or have a problem. And so. It's pretty uh, transformational. We've had only a few people cry in front of us, uh, not too many, but there have been some amazing transformations out of that. I, I gotta believe, though, there was points where, no, but it's a really great idea. Oh, yeah, we that right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the key, so I'm, along with Doug, I've been teaching iCode forever. Now I also teach it for NSF and NIH. And I think the core component is, and I bring it into venture. I brought that mentality of problem. I get your early stage. I get your whiz, whiz, the doodle does all these amazing things. But what benefit does it have? Solve what problem does it solve for whom? And really trying to get folks who have been building a widget and it does these twenty things to think about: you know what problems am I solving? How am I changing the workflow? What is the you know, who am I just potentially displacing with what I do? This program really is extremely important. And I want to raise the point of government. So we often are, you know, really grumbly about all the things that are happening in government. But this i program is extremely um, important. I'm now part of a program called um, the Convergence Accelerator that NSF is leading to try to bring teams together to solve really big world problems. Totally experimental, but we're going to run it out over the next three years to see how it runs. The state of Michigan has been transformational in the role of what's happened in the ecosystem. So it support, has supported almost every single entrepreneurship, accelerator, um, all the smart zones, all the different programs. They sponsor the pitch competitions. They are the fundamental sponsor of many of the things that this community has levered. So as we grumble about government, just remember how critical it plays a role at the um, state level and our ecosystem, but also at the federal level and its support of the research and the innovation um, that we're trying to bring to market. So I can speak to the change I've seen in the university, and it's really, you know, it's obvious, but it's a cultural change. And a few people I'd like to shout out for that. Uh, one is my predecessor, Dave Munson. He played a major role there as Dean of Engineering because he created the first Associate Dean for Entrepreneurship uh, in the College of Engineering, Thomas Zerbuchen. And one of the things that came out of it, of course, was CFE. So that was very helpful. The other one person I had to mention is actually Steve Forrest when he's Vice President for Research because he used to joke with me that Mary Sue Coleman, who was the president at the time, had him on speed dial because of conflicts of interest. <laughs> and I say that as a joke because Steve allowed us to push the envelope in terms of understanding that conflicts of interest are to be managed but not avoided. And so he taught us that it's okay to be a scholar as well as an entrepreneur. And so now you fast forward uh, to this very day. I think a lot of the things that we take for granted, uh, really a few people pave the way. And the last thing I want to say is that we should not be at all comfortable in resting on our laurels at all. Every top engineering college across the country is having the same sort of discussions we are. You have Georgia Tech with their Tech Square, you have Cornell Tech. It's not just Stanford and MIT, it's Boulder, it's University of Illinois now making Chicago their innovation hub. So it's great that we, we come a long way but we have a lot of work to do and a heck of a lot of competition. It's not just for the coasts. So, great segue. What do we need to be working on next? What's coming? What should we be thinking about? So, um, I think we have to be careful of a couple of holes I think we're going to start to see uh, in the ecosystem. So, in terms of what we need, but I think also what we need to avoid. Um, we're already starting to see early warning signs that coastal uh, well-funded tech companies are going to start trying to grab talent out of an arm, right? Uh, one data point, Amazon, they're offering engineers, I think it's like a 200K salary to go work in Detroit at their company. 
Um, and for one year, that's the sunny book. This is 100K sunny book. Don't say that too loud, okay? And, <laughs> and, and they, I'm sure they know it. <laughs> um, so we have to be careful that we don't see, and old KLA 10 core is a huge success, right? But it's going to create pressures on housing, right? Uh, real estate prices are going to go up. Um, the, the reach for talent, uh, we got to watch out for these things. So um, one of the things that I'm part of is something Doug Song was, had, had a vision for, along with Jeff Reinfeldt and Bruchan, is an entrepreneur fund um, in Ann Arbor. It's called the Ann Arbor Entrepreneurs Fund. And, and it's a group of entrepreneurs that have, uh, are putting together, uh, pledging 1% of their future profits towards a nonprofit to actually invest in things so we don't turn into uh, San Francisco. But we can't do that, no. But we do need to watch out for pay and equity, got to focus on diversity, it's still not diverse enough. Ann Arbor is a very diverse community, that's what attracted, uh, why I was attracted to it. Um, but in our ecosystem, it's still not. So those are things we need to keep focused on. Yep. So along those lines, um, the rating of talent among our faculty is a huge challenge for us. So uh, large companies with unlimited resources are rating faculty members from the very top uh, universities. Uh, this is in robotics, computer science, even, even civil engineering, as a matter of fact, for the, the new uh, built world. So one of the challenges that we're going to face, it's sort of the price of success as we have more high profile faculty members, as we have more of an ecosystem in the gray area, there's going to be a poaching of our faculty. And so what we're trying to do is find ways of having faculty members go on these multi-year leaves. But then we have to find out and make sure we find a way of making the University of Michigan. And in many cases, Ann Arbor Southeast uh, region of Michigan writ large, attractive for those faculty members to come back because the, the kind of resources in terms of compensation plus access to data and access to facilities, university can never ever match, nor should we be in that business of trying. So I will also say, so I think that it is important and that is a critical thing to, to be thoughtful of. We also have to embrace people moving, right? So I run a fund where, you know, I, I'm training up analysts all the time and they're leaving my fund to go on and do other bigger things. And that's great. And it's great within our startups. And it's painful if you are the CEO or you're the dean of a university and your top talent leaves. But it comes around. If you're treating people well, you're training them, you're giving them great opportunity, they will forever be a part of your network and your growth of that network. And you know, I think this fund is a great example of people who had a great experience and are giving back. So being thoughtful that we can't be fearful of people moving. We have to do the things we need to retain people. But at the end of the day, what makes our startups better are people moving. You know, they get their first startup. They're you know a low-level engineer. They move to you know managing uh, engineering team and then become the VP of engineer at a new startup. Right. So that transition of folks and experience um, really does help an ecosystem, though we do have to be competitive with the market. Are there any questions from any of you? Um, what type of efforts do you think are necessary to make this ecosystem more diverse in terms of more women starting businesses and more underrepresented minorities? So the question was, what do we need to do or what can be done to help make this a more diverse ecosystem for women and underrepresented minorities? Um, so I'm on the Michigan Venture Capital Association uh, board and I chair the talent committee. And we have diversity as an important uh, uh, pillar for what we focus on. One of the interesting things I found in that role is it's very hard to put your finger on tangible things to do. And one of the things I've been starting to do lately is accumulate um, tools that people are using, kind of best practices. And one of them, I think, for example, is how we post jobs, how do we talk about roles and projects. And there's actually some uh, great tools I was talking to uh, the head of the Kresge Investment Group, that they're very focused on this. And they have tools you can apply to your um, job posts that actually point out your biases as the writer of the job description around gender or diversity. And so I think 
the reason I bring this up is being frustrated that we haven't found one kind of you know killer thing to do to increase diversity is I think we need to focus on all the little things that we can do and make it forefront of our mind because that'll start moving the ball as well while we still continue to look for these big ideas. But I know in the town committee, uh, we've been heading up a program called the um, Venture Fellows, where we place analysts at venture funds or help reimburse um, some of the costs of analysts at venture funds and diversity become part of the screening process for that to try to get more diversity into venture capital. So it's intentionality. You have to be intentional about it and you have to be thoughtful about the differences and the biases and what you're trying to look for. So as a team, I make sure I'm hiring a diverse team because they have to be able to work in the ecosystems where my normal network wouldn't be. They need to be building networks with diverse founders. And they need to represent investors. Founders need, diverse founders need to see diverse investors. And so this is an absolute passion of mine. It's really critical that you can have a conversation with someone that looks like you, or if they don't look like you, you can understand where they're coming from and having different people on your team to help see those natural biases and to try to reduce them is important. Because how um, women think of building their cash flows and their, their projections, we're just a lot more conservative. So we walk into a venture meeting and our numbers are gonna be half of what our male colleague might look like. Um, my my uh, African American founder might not really under, might not trust us as ventures folks. And so, as you're going into the deal process, being really, really spending time educating on why these terms exist, why you know how what percentage is normal, how giving them folks to talk to so they can trust the process. Right, so there are lots of these small, little embedded differences, but that we have to be working to understand if we're going to make change. You know, I, um, I run a tech firm here in town, and uh, <laughs> tech firms are notably uh, uh, skewed in the male direction, and yet Menlo is about 50-50 men and women. Uh, and uh, we had another tech firm that was virtually zero women, and they came to us and they asked, so what are you guys doing? And, and you know, and we said, about what? And they, they said, you have girls working for you. <laughs> I said, well, number one, we don't call them girls. So that's <laughs> <actually retarded." laughs> and, and my simple answer, and I said this to our team, I said, I think one of the reasons we have women working here is because we have women working here. And it, it, and it resonated with women on the team. Uh, we have another problem at Menlo that you know everybody's wrestling with this these days, and it's around uh, uh, pay-based gender equity, right? Or gender-based pay equity. And um, we have a public display of compensation at Menlo, so everybody knows what everybody's making. It's a little wall chart with post-it notes where everybody is, and so everybody at Menlo knows what everybody's making. So you can actually see highest paid to lowest paid. And we do tours, as you know, and people come in and I show them this, and I said, look, I'll fess up, we got a, a, a gender equity problem in pay, and I'm working on it, but I don't know exactly how to solve it. And I said, let me read from top to bottom, Carol, Carol, <laughs> Michelle, Lisa, Emily, uh, <laughs> and uh, I said, so I look at the guys and I say, I swear I'll keep working on it, but I'm not sure what to do about it. Uh, but uh, what's interesting in our world, and I think this maybe is a broader topic for us, we probably have a whole other panel on this, but all of our promotions are peer-based rather than boss-based. Uh, one of the problems is we don't have any bosses, so that'd be really hard to do that in our place. But, uh, but I think when you start tearing down traditional systems for how we make any decisions, uh, you start to get a different result. So, other questions? Yeah, considering how much Ann Arbor has changed in the last 10 years, what would be your vision of what we would look like 10 years from now? I'm going to just chime in. Less congestion on roads, <laughs> more downtown parking, uh, May mobility, autonomous shuttles getting us from convenient park and ride lots downtown, uh, and the same awesome restaurants we have today. But maybe you guys have different ideas. <laughs> 
And, and I'm, you know, I'm a downtown business owner, and it is driving me nuts uh, these days about parking and about congestion. And you know, and I get it. We're probably better than most places on the planet. But when you got, when you got used to the old way, and now the new way is, you know, creeping along at two miles an hour. From it, there was a night I had to go visit uh, the folks from Lamasoft. They got an office down by Briarwood because they're doing some renovations. It took me 45 minutes to get from here to Briarwood. I can get to Detroit faster than that. So, so it's a tough question, right? I'll, I'll give you a, maybe what I would hope it would look like. Um, I think, and again, my focus is all about technology in my fund, so everything I see is all technology. Um, so I'm biased. But um, the wave of AI taking over uh, the future is real. And there is a lot of talent and technology in Michigan, in Southeast Michigan, that can be very instrumental in helping be part of the future in that area. So I'd love to see Ann Arbor as kind of the, the smart city that everyone kind of uh, wants to uh, uh, try out the latest technology in or build their companies in. Because we have all the ingredients to be part of a very um, highly dense, uh, futuristic, um, leading, uh, society here in Ann Arbor is diverse, it's got all the engineering and the talent and, and the university is uh, very broad. Um, we have the uh, uh, automotive industry which knows how to build things and the software is becoming part of their life. Um, uh, it creates a lot of opportunity. So I, th and I think earlier we talked about a lot of things we're worried about. I think that's actually the first time I've been on a panel where we had these kind of good problems to talk about. We're fearful of crazy real estate or poaching of people, right? That wasn't a problem 15 years ago as much. I mean, it was a problem, but it wasn't as much 15 years ago. So we're, we're talking now about good problems. Um, but I do think we have the opportunity to kind of take a leadership position uh, in the future of AI and robotics uh, in the industry. Let me just uh, echo that, but also say that maybe a slight modification would be that Ann Arbor would be a vibrant suburb of a vibrant Detroit. Mm -hmm. And that we're playing a major role in an amazing Detroit with really wonderful transit options. <laughs> and hey, three national championships uh, uh, football, a couple in basketball would be awesome as well. Uh, hope springs eternal. Um, all right, we got time for one last question, one last burning question from the crowd. It seems like uh, Michigan has a pretty good uh, venture capital uh, ecosystem for at, at the reasonably low end. But what we don't, and we've got great grants for startups, but what we don't have is the real angel. The Michigan Angel Fund, Blue Water Angel, they're not really angels anymore. They're venture funds. They don't seem to be. They don't act like angel funds. Uh, can the panel address that issue? I know Invest Detroit invests early on, but, but still, you know, a lot of times you're requiring revenue before you invest in a company. Uh, so can we talk a little bit more about the uh, true angel ecosystem and, and what we can do to try to get those people here? Yeah, so this is a really interesting problem, uh, and we see it every day with our companies that we're working with because we do write the first institutional check, but they're only, you know, sometimes if you need, you really do need a million dollars in capital or you need, I mean, it's not even that, you just need a couple hundred thousand, we can write a hundred thousand dollar check, but where does that other 200,000 come from? And so the a wonderful thing about this state is we've developed some amazing angel networks and groups. So we have Grand Angels, we have Michigan Angel Fund, we have Blue Water Angels. Um, these groups have done such a great job of finding people, coming together, writing these bigger checks, and they're great partners for us as we move companies through. But what we have lost are the super angels. So some of the super angels, thinking like the Walt Youngs and the Terry Cross, not that they're not still active super angels, but they were out there leading lots of deals and doing lots, writing lots of checks on their own. There's just not a lot of folks 
because they have the security of the venture or the angel group, they're tending to stay within the angel group and writing their checks within that group. But the angel groups are effectively acting like a fund, if they and many of them have their own funds. So they're needing to become later stage in order to get fund returns that match an institutional fund. So that enabling of these folks to write single checks or checks outside of what the fund would normally invest in is going to be really important because we need the rise of the super angels, the folks who are educated to help the companies grow, aren't going to screw up the cap table early on, but who are willing to write a check knowing that the likelihood of getting that money back is zero. right? But we have lost some of that individual angel um, deal here. All right, let's thank our panel here. And, and now it's on to the main show, the Celebrate Invention show. And uh, I understand that for the researchers themselves, there's an opportunity to win a prize. So, all right. And by the way, everybody, just so you know, the Michigan Angel Fund number four is open till the end of November. Uh, commercial brought to you by Bill Mayer of Banner for Spark. Thank you, Bill. <laughs>